Concept and analysis. Who walked in? Cynthia and Chanel. Okay. Everybody else is late. Okay. Listen, we've got a we got a, a boatload of information to go over this weekend. Yes, Ryan. Late. We got a boatload of information to go through. While I see the book out, while I see the book out, can I borrow the book for a second? Because I didn't bring my copy. Okay. This is the only text that you're required to have in the class. I haven't asked you to read it yet. But what I'm asking you to do is, I'm asking you to read it this week. I'm going to ask you to read it this week. I may or may not be here next week. If I'm not here, you will go over stuff in this book. If I am here, you will not go over stuff on this book. Then you'll start going over stuff on this book the week after. So, I don't know. Oh, yeah. No, no. you cut got class. I mean, come on. Of course there's a sub. I mean, I wouldn't like... I mean, I'm not going to cheat you. Uh, some of you may want to cheat yourselves and not do all the work. But I would never cheat you up. Aaron, I'm not looking at you. So, uh... Is he cool or she cool? Are they cool? I mean, what's let's be gender proper. Are they cool? Is it cool? <laughs> I think he's cool. I think. I don't know. I mean, I think so. So, hmm. so I just, I got a lot of stuff going on and I, I may not be here. So, anyway. Um, um, so, we went through some. So, we talked about two weeks ago, it's actually one of the questions on a quiz, like a couple of weeks ago, like what areas are, you know, financial concepts, you know, accounting concepts, financial reporting concepts, different or unique in the real estate industry, and there's four or five that I think are critical in this class that we need to focus on, and we talked about development costs, we talked about revenue recognition or, or sales of real estate, we talked about leases because of the way they're structured. Um, and well, we definitely talked about accounting for uh, investments, you know, joint ventures, um, subsidiaries, consolidations, things like that. Those are like the four sort of critical areas. We went through leases and revenue recognition last week. We're going to endeavor to cover development costs today. I don't think we're going to get to accounting for joint ventures, but I'm prepared to do that if we, if we get there. I'm going to sidetrack a little bit. I always like to do a little segment on taxation because people have questions. I'm not a tax expert, but I think it's important to at least just go over sort of tax concepts. We'll do that today. We'll go over the case study, and then we're, what we're going to do is also give you some material to help prepare the next case study. Okay? So, uh, and then we're going to do current events, which we, I ask all the time, and I always ask the question. We're going to start with a question. Where's 10-year treasury today? 2.13. I got somebody read the newspaper. Yeah, I mean, it's not that difficult. You should know this, Aaron. Uh, oh, God. <laughs> Just kidding. I had a kid once. I was like, what's six, what's six times eight? Hey, Siri, you got a kid. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, 2.13. So, is that good? No, that's bad. It's good or bad? You say it's good. Okay, why is it good? Put you on the spot. Why is it good? I think I think it's uh, lower than the average. Than the average. What average? For the last few uh, weeks. Yeah. So why would that be good? Uh, returns higher than that. Better. Okay, but why would lower interest rates be good for anybody? So it, let's take an old man like me, right? I got to live off fixed income, right? Why would low interest rates be good for me? Oh, you're thinking uh, you're on the other side of it. So when, whenever there's debt, there's two people involved, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the guy who borrows, right? So then there's a person who postpones consumption and then the guy who like spends now. So you're like, you're one of these young people that just spends now. 
So, so when we talk about all these sort of macro societal implications of interest rates, there are two sides of the equation, right? There's a good side and a bad side, or the other way around. Okay, so you're going to pay less for the money you spend now. Okay, that's good. Why is it bad? are uncertain about the market, about what's going okay. on in the general environment. It says uncertainty. So, well, so let's, I, let, let's how do we get there? I, that's right, but how do we get there? Why, why would, so bond yields, at the end of the day, interest rates are, um, there's something called the loanable funds theory. Let's do a little quiz so we can figure out how interest rates are composed. Let's do a little quiz. Let's do, okay, so I want to borrow money from you. Let's do it the other way. I want to borrow money from you. I want to borrow $1,000 from everybody in this class. Okay? I'm going to pay you back in a year. I'll pay you back in a year. How much do you want me to pay you back in a year? More than what you borrowed. Well, how much? Give me a number. Um, 1200 <laughs> Okay? Chanel, give me a number. How much do you want me to pay you back? Fifteen hundred. Oh, oh. <laughs> got a bunch of skull user. <laughs> Jeffrey. Uh, Eleven hundred. Okay, then we're starting to talk a little bit like more my game, you know. I haven't borrowed money yet, so Nathan? The same, eleven hundred. Eleven hundred. Okay, Sean, what do you say? Uh, one thousand fifty dollars. Mm. Okay, wow. They now I'm gonna start borrowing money. A thousand twenty. I'm gonna borrow money here. Okay? And so we could keep going down the line, but at the end of the day at the end of the day, do I hear a thousand? I mean if we're in Europe, what would people say? Give me nine ninety. <laughs> okay, I mean the reality is in Europe somebody would say that, right? You say, Well I'd rather so at the end of the day, uh, and, and this is a theory and this is a very simple model or way to explain it. But that's how interest rates are composed. It's all the supply and demand. I need to borrow $1,000. You're only willing to give it up if I give you $1,200 in a year. You're only willing to give it up if I give you $1,500 and so on down the line. Well, at a certain point, it's going to make sense to me. And at a certain point, it's not going to make sense to me, right? So what I'm definitely going to do is, is I'll start borrowing there, but there's only limited capacity there, right? So once that's taken up, then the next guy's going to come here, right? And, and somewhere, and then if you really want to put money to work, at some point you'll start lowering your expectations, right? So, you know, at some point if you kind of look at the old supply and demand thing, there's going to be an equilibrium. And I'm not an economist, and I don't believe in economics, you know, as a part of science, but it does help explain things. And so, um, when we take a look at that interest rate, so the return on those $1,000 are going to find a level based upon the supply, of funds and the demand. There's going to be a lot of people that need to borrow money and there's going to be people that are willing to postpone spending their money in order to get a higher dollar in the future, right? And somewhere along the way there's going to be an equilibrium. Well, in today's environment, what, you know, from a risk-free perspective, what the market is telling us is, is people are willing to take, you know, 1,023, you know, 21.3 in 10 years. And so I think going to the point is, is, is the certainty of getting that lower return in 10 years is what's driving people or driving those yields down. People are saying, no, 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 we want security, we want security, we want security, right? And so people keep buying these bonds, keep buying these bonds and driving the yields down, okay? And so it's, that's how you explain the uncertainty. And so people are saying, hey, we're uncertain about what's happening. Where were we three weeks ago, four weeks ago, when we started this class? 2.456. 2. 2. Yeah, 2.4. Two, now, so we dropped 30 some odd basis points. What percentage is out of the interest rates? More than 10%. I mean, we've had a 10% drop in interest rates, in the benchmark interest rate that we use over a three week period, four week period. That doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound normal, does it? That's a huge drop, right? So, um, what's happened with the yield curve? We talked about the yield curve. I've kind of given you examples. So, it's inverted. It's inverted. What's inverting? And, and so, yeah. uh, three-month yields are 2.38. Right? 
I think five year, I only did three spots this week. The, uh, the two year is right at 2.0, and then the 10 year is at 2.13. So you can see how, you know, investing short term, you're gonna, you know, gain, you know, gain, gain more money, okay, or earn more money. So it's kind of, it's definitely kind of going, you know, kind of like that. So, um, yeah, I, I'd say that there's a little bit of uncertainty with that. There's no, there's no doubt. And, and people in the media this week were starting to pick up again on the thought, on the point that an inverted yield curve is not usually a sign of, um, well, expectation. You know, assuming that the market is right, okay, assuming that the market is right, um, the perspective is not really great. Investors aren't. And what happened to the stock market as a consequence, by the way? We've got six straight weeks of losses in the stock market, right? Where's the S&P 500 trade? 20, 20, 27.52, you said, right? Is that what you yeah, said? Yeah, I said that. Okay, 27.50. And it, and it was right up around 2,900, so that's also come, you know, backed off a fair bit. So, um, so the markets are telling us that, be careful, right? Be careful. But that doesn't mean it's the end of the world, but we got to read tea leaves. Okay, that's what the, this class is giving you tools to start evaluating or you know reviewing things like that. Okay, so uh, I didn't bring. I want to talk about some things that a couple of students asked about this week. So I didn't bring a lot of current events, and I will go over those things. Let me go through my current events first. I, interesting. I thought this was interesting. It was an article in one of these newsletters that talked about the top ten malls in the country. And two of them happen to be right here. One is Sawgrass Mills, and the other one's out in Tora. Sawgrass Mills. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and at the end of the day, so we can talk about, and there's gazillions of reasons why retail is an issue and why we're concerned. But you know, go to Sawgrass Mills and look for parking right on a Saturday. Go to go to Aventura and look for parking. Go to Dadeland and look for parking. Okay, and so. What was the thing? I was at a, I was at an event at our at our church last night, and the archbishop was talking, and he said something. He's an old Polish guy, and he said something about, "I love Miami. It's as close as you can get to the United States without actually being there." Or something. <laughs> <laughs> something, something crazy like that, you know. Like, um, uh, we're going to go through this a little bit more, and in, in, uh, hopefully, one of the, the classes we'll start getting into more due diligence type concepts. I'm going to give you at least. Some of my perspectives on how to uh, how to evaluate markets. So I know in some of your classes you guys look at like you know demographics in the area and things like that. I'm I'm going to focus a little bit more on the supply and demand paradigm. And definitely, real estate is a is a supply and demand business. And if if you don't believe that, then you know then you haven't really read the tea leaves. I you know I use, I use an example. Um, so it's like 2008, 2009, three towers break ground in downtown Miami, office towers. Each one of them is roughly 600,000 square feet. So there's 1.8 million square feet coming into the market all at the same time. Now, we've had a huge run up. To build a tower takes years, right? Not only because of the time of the construction, but all the planning involved, right? So these people start acquiring sites, going through you know, fundraising and concepting and planning and approvals. In 2005, 2006, everybody thinks everything's great. By the time they start breaking ground, it's 2008, and they start, you know, so they start breaking ground right when the market all blows up, right? And they're going to deliver 1.8 million square feet into how big is the CBD office market in Miami? Does anybody know? Does anybody know how big the CBD market is in Broward? How long we be in real estate if we don't know these things? You should know these things. So in downtown Miami, it depends if you talk about the CBD, which is north of the river, or Brickell, which is south of the river. But you've got 20 some odd million square feet, depending on how you want to define the market, whether you want to talk about just class A and B, or if you want to expand the C. But let's call it 25 million square feet. What do you think happens if you drop 1.8 million square feet, you know, almost 10% of supply into a market? Rents, I mean, how do you absorb, how do you absorb that, right? What happened to rents? I mean, it came down like $10 a square foot. Bless you, it came down like $10 a square foot. Now, that's the problem with 
especially central business district office, right? You've got to build the density. You can't build 100,000 square feet at the time. You've got to drop, boom, a million. You're going to impact the market. I mean, you're almost in a way going to be your own worst enemy, right? So um, an area, a, a, an asset class that has been red hot or white hot, as this article says, for years has been the industrial market, especially industrial in, in, in major port cities and, you know, lately the last sort of, you know, sort of buzzword and all that has been um, last mile stuff, so people are talking about smaller things, you know. What do we got? Pogo sticks or the last mile is that we talked about <laughs> last week. But anyway, so this article says the tight av availability of storage spaces is likely to loosen with capacity finally catching up to demand. So, yeah, and so again, this is an article with a bunch of, you know, prognosis and all that, but uh, they're talking about the industrial market in this country growing to like 14.8 billion square feet. Uh, by 2023. And they're finally talking that, you know, based on the announced development schedule, by like 2020, 2021, supply starts outstripping demand. And so we'll go through some, we'll talk about things like absorption. I'll, I'll show you some techniques that I've used in the back on how to, how to read, how to gauge the, 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 the markets, right, based upon what's been happening. But but, you know, whereas it's been nice and healthy and all that to invest in industrial for a while and cap rates in some markets are like 4%, maybe even less, and people think they've got a lot of pricing power, you got to start reading what's coming down the pipeline. Because at some point, I tell you, real estate, simple business. It's a supply and demand business, and people are not the smartest ones. And what happens is when things are so hot, everybody wants to build for there, and then what happens? You overbuild, and what's the first thing people do when all of a sudden they, people drop rents? You know, and it could take you 10 years to build up to a rent level, and you can drop all of that in, in a couple of months. Yes, Nathan? Is that part of normal analysis before you actually start? Before you start thinking about well, it should, it should be that not only what the, what the demand is, so whether it's normal or not, but who else is building or who may be building. Or, yeah, I'll show you. I'll show you a chart that I used to do. We used to, um, we had a large brokerage operation. And we used to produce these market analyses report that we'd send our clients. And I, at one point in my tenure there, I took over that department and I said, you know what, this is all proprietary stuff. I, you know, I don't care about the market. I want, and we sort of refocused that report to a, 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 an internal development one. And we definitely took a look at, uh, we took a look at, the size of the market, we took a look at absorption, we took a look at rents, and we took a look at um, expected deliveries going into, into the future. And we took a look at announcements, so things that were under construction and expected to be delivered, but things that were also announced, which may not always come to fruition. Yes, Aaron? What database did you use to find that? I mean, a lot of this stuff we use, we just use CoStar because yeah. it was cheap enough. At one point, so, you know, I'm a financial guy, right? But when I got there, we had like four people calling around. Yeah. And I said, well, we're paying for CoStar. And, you know, so we got rid of three people and used CoStar. I mean, I, I, I mean I'm mean, i not not that I'm like that kind of guy or like I'm insensitive to people working and all that. But, I mean, we're just rep, you got to be efficient in business, right? So if you've got, if you're paying for a service that is calling every property out there and is canvassing every developer, why do you need to redo it? You know? And as you know, as 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 people did, I mean, you could go to CBRE. One of our former students runs a research area for Jones Lang LaSalle here in in Broward. You know, she does a great job. You know, I don't need to recreate what she does. I just need to understand it and and have access to it. So, um, yeah, I mean, maybe we might have had ninety eight percent certainty if we did it, but I got ninety six percent with somebody else's service, right? So. Uh, you know, there's a lot of information out there, and it, it's it's uh, it's probably I, I think it's more cost effective. That's you know at a certain point what you do. I think well, that's my perspective. Okay, all right. So yeah, so yeah, definitely what's coming down is is you know is, is definitely an important metric to look at, right? Um, I will expect this is from Moody's. I get these Moody's things every day, but uh, expect yield curve inversion you know, will bring on many defaults. So, 
whatever. I, you know, you just have to be careful with this stuff. That's just, I'm not telling you it's the end of the world that things are happening. Uh, the, the kind of, you know, going back to the, uh, the retail bit, uh, there, there's an article here somewhere that came out during the week that said 7,500 stores will close this year, major malls. 7,500 stores. That's a lot of stores. Now, you you, you got to contrast that with Bath and Body Works really thrives in stores. I mean, some like things, I guess, are sensory, right? I mean, if you need to, I don't know, I've never been in those stores. I, I imagine they sell stuff that smells and things like that. You know, how do you smell through the internet, right? I mean, I don't know. Uh, and then just sort of the, you know, where the world's going. Costco will refill a certain Sears spot at a Northgate Mall. Same day delivery booth sales at Target. So things are happening, but people are still buying, right? Consumption is still going up. So as real estate guys, right, so the question is, is are we going to own a mall or are we going to build a, a, a distribution center for, you know, for a company? Are we going to build a call center to handle customer service, you know, calls for a particular... And that's, that's, the thing, that's what we have to be thinking, right? Or do we build smaller malls? Or do we build malls that maybe have, you know, more, what's the word, experience, sensory things, you know, food and theater and stuff like that as opposed to raw retail. We need to understand what's happening in the market in order to make decisions. It's not just deliveries. It's what are, what are trends? Those up. Who's heard of Peter Lynch? I have. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, who's Peter Lynch? He works for, he's, he wrote a couple of good books actually about the, the stock market. But um, he works with Fidelity, I think. Yeah, I don't know if he still works with Fidelity, but he, he was a long time. Can you help me open up these things as I, I like white guys. I, I, there's dozens, so be careful. All right. Um, Peter Lynch um, used to run, he's a money manager, he used to run a, something that was called the Magellan Fund, which in its day was the largest of the mutual funds out there. Um, he, you know, very simple book he wrote about investing, and he just said, "Look, I just go to the malls and just follow the people. You know, so people buy sneakers. I'm, I'm going to invest in Nike. You know, I'm going to invest in Foot Locker. So, you know, his whole thing is, I just want to understand what's happening in the marketplace. And so, if I understand that, then um, I'm going to be a good investor. And that's what, as real estate professionals, we need to understand what's happening in the marketplaces. Okay, that's what we have to be." you know, sort of attuned to, right? You know, retailers are investing in robotics and in other technologies. So, uh, you know, there's a machine called Marty. I don't know what that is, but I think it's like a little robot thing. I saw a picture of the other day, but it, it can identify garbage, spills, and out of place items in stores. And, you know, and if you stop to think, I, I don't know much about retailing, retailing itself. But like shrinkage is a big problem. You know, people stealing stuff. You know, imagine if you can drop that a couple percentage points. How how that can affect your bottom line. Um, private equity real estate may have to target lower returns. Um, Um, I don't usually spend a lot of time in this class talking about um, when we talk about <coughs> real estate investing there's kind of three places where people want to put their money and I don't know if this is something that you guys cover in a real estate finance class or not, but people talk about core investing, people talk about value or value add investing, people talk about opportunity. Does any these concepts make any sense or yes? Yes to everybody or no? To some. Okay, so um, so when we talk about stocks, people kind of talk about two general types of investing. People talk about value and people talk about growth. Have you ever heard that? Yeah. Okay. And this tends to be slower growth companies, more mature business, you know, businesses, cash flowing, dividend payers, 
lower capital appreciation, more current income. These tend to be fast growing, newer technology plays, less cash flow, no dividends, but hopefully huge appreciation. We, we went over holding period return one day here. Did we go over holding period return one day? We didn't go over holding period. What's holding period return? Yes, Ryan. It is the rate of return on an investment over a given over period. Eight, over, yeah. over really any period. So yeah. this is really, it's an undiscounted and sort of time frame agnostic return. Do we know what holding period return, what the formula for holding period return is? What is it? Price at the end minus price at the beginning. And then over... Hold on, we forgot something. Okay. okay. Over what? I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you take over. Over what? Yeah, no, no, come on. It's over... Over, um, over price at the beginning. Price. At but you've forgotten one thing. We could have distributions or dividends during that period, right? Yeah. And, and so this is holding period return. Guys, it's real simple. Um, the stock's worth 110 at the end of a year. You buy it for 100, right? And you got a 5% or $5 dividend, right? So what is that, 15 over 100? <coughs> What's your return? 15%, right? Now, the reason I did that is not to show you more math and more formulas, but it's really to illustrate a concept, and that's to say your holding period return is comprised of two different components. And that's really critical when we talk about investing in real estate, okay? And there's a component of your return which is made up of price appreciation, okay? Capital appreciation, and there's a component that's comprised of current income. And so when we think of stock investing, we think of value investing, one being, one that's probably going to be more focused on a dividend component, and we look at growth being one that's probably more dependent upon price appreciation. So for example, let's just do an example. AT&T today has a dividend yield of 6% give or take. What are long-term historical interest rate uh, returns on, 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 on large cap um, stocks? What are historical returns, long-term historical returns? Call it, average. Yeah, 2, 2. 8 to 10? No. Dividend returns or full? No, just the large in general. Absolute returns. Oh, yeah. I, seven. Yeah. Eight. Seven, seven and a half. So, so if you have a stock that's yielding six percent in dividend, is the market expecting a significant component of price appreciation? No, no. Not likely, right? Now, let's take a look at Nvidia. Nvidia pays like, you know, minute dividends, and that's even sort of a less of a growth story now, but, but. So it's not paying any dividends to speak of. What 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 is the market expecting? They're expecting that seven to ten percent because now there's going to be more expectation, right? But they're expecting it in a way of price appreciation, okay? And so, if I just erase that for a second, when we talk about real estate investing, we can kind of think of the core and growth stories here, right, with like a sort of, you know, intermediary step, but we're thinking of, we're thinking of um, returns that are more focused on current income versus returns that are focused more on capital appreciation, right? And there's going to be specific assets that are going to fall logically much more in this sphere than they would here. So for example, what might be an asset that fits as a classic core asset in real estate? Uh, like an office building in a Where? Town, New York City. Charlotte, Louisiana. Well, maybe not Charlotte, likely. Likely in a in a in a twenty four hour city, likely in a central business district is what I was looking for. So you're gonna be looking for things that have a high credit component, long term lease structure, sort of guaranteed income, more like a bond. Right? So um, 
cap rates aren't going to move very much, right? There's not a lot of value enhancement that you can do. You're going to buy a pristine asset that's going to be well kept. There's not going to be any deferred maintenance. It's going to be fully occupied or very close to fully occupied. And there's going to be a known return. And so who would buy in this, in this realm? Institutional money. Institutional wealthy families, endowments, right? High net worth individuals, right? People that need a steady income. <clears throat> What's another asset class or an asset that would likely fit into, into a poor structure? Industrial in major port cities. So class A industrial in major port cities, right? Give me another one. There's a very classic one that, I mean, we're all sort of bypassing. Uh, McDonald's, like a single ten at least. Yeah, a, tri a triple net, like a... Um, Sounds like Affordable housing? Mm -hmm. The people saying. don't pay. <laughs> 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 how, how about just multifamily, like a class A? Yeah, that's, how, how, that's what you met, right? Uh, so, 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 you know, we're talking about somewhere in like a nice part of like, I don't know, in Weston or something, a nice 400 unit, you know, project that's brand new and fully leased. So, multifamily, high occupancy rates, an opportunity to mark rents to market every year, right? So, you see CBD office, industrial, multifamily. Let's look at the other end of the spectrum. What would be an opportunity type investment? An upcoming area? Yeah, upcoming area. But like these, an up and coming area. Like Flagler Village. What? Like Flagler Village. I don't know what Flagler Village oh, is. Okay. But like, give me an asset class. So give me an area. Give me, give me an investment. I mean, I could say, oh, it's Alaska's opportunity. Yeah, it is. There's a lot of opportunity in Alaska. <laughs> Like electric gas stations, okay? Electric. You know, I mean, I mean. I've never heard yeah. that. Uh, that that's well, hold, hold on, hold on, Brian. Yes, Ryan. Um, mine was like a manufacturing in an area that's not like South Florida. But let, let's be more precise. Like CBD. Let, I'll throw one out okay. to get you to think. Sure. How about just how about just greenfield development? Mm. There's no known cash flow. There's development risk, right? There's construction risk. So let's just think about greenfield development. Let's look about brownfield redevelopment. We gotta clean up something. Again, how about just redevelopment in general? We gotta vacate a retail center, refurbish it, and retenant the place, okay? So now you're looking at things where you've got known cash flow, and here we've got no cash flow. Not even uncertain, you have no cash flow and a lot of risk. Okay, so those are kind of the, the two ends of the spectrum, right? And what would be value? Like a whole uh, hold on, Let, let's try to move faces. Anthony. So maybe a multifamily that's maybe 20, 30 years old. So maybe a class B multifamily that you can slowly redo all the units, yeah? Maybe a secondary market for an office building, not a primary, you know, so maybe you're not going to have the same credit profile, you might not buy business practice, have, you know, a law firm in New York probably signs a lease for 30 years or 15 years with, you know, a bunch of extensions. Maybe in Charlotte, it's five years, you know? Uh, so yeah, so maybe secondary markets, less credit, less certainty to cash flow, maybe an asset that's not, maybe an office building that's only 50% lease because they just lost a big tenant. Sean, did you have your hand up with an idea? Uh, no. Oh no, I thought I thought you did. That's why. I'm no, sorry. Uh, self storage facility. Then? Yeah. So there's a bunch of asset classes that would. Although the way some of them are priced, you actually are almost up here. Because I had a friend that owned three of those, and he said it's like a graveyard. When people move in, they never move out. You know, and and you got access to their stuff. But yeah, I mean, I there's a lot of ancillary classes here. So. Maybe class B industrial stuff that's not industrial grade, so maybe six, 16 foot high, small bay, front loaded type buildings, triple net leases, gas stations, that kind of stuff. So, so in this space, you go from known cash flow, little cash appreciation, no cash flow, a lot of appreciation, and this is some sort of middle ground. Uh, it, it's kind of hard to put a, a peg on it, but I would say in 
today's environment, people are probably looking for returns, you know, anywhere from six to eight percent. And in these asset classes, people are looking obviously greater than eight and maybe less than I mean, you could say 12, I want to say a range of 12 to 15 in a more normalized setting. And opportunity is anything over 15%, but really, I'd say 20%. So, what did I give you this whole long thing? So, when people invest in real estate, when people invest in private equity, they are looking for funds that have specific focus, right? So, when you invest in a real estate fund, the asset manager, the sponsor will say, here's the rules of the fund. And they're going to say, we can't invest more than so much in a certain geography or in an asset class or in a type building. Um, but they're definitely going to target certain returns based upon what they're looking for. Okay, And so people are going to invest in core funds, value funds, or opportunity funds. Sometimes people, you know, this is kind of like a, some people call some things like a core plus. Some people might call some of these things value plus, but the reality is there's core value and opportunity. Now, when I've told you all this stuff, for more, probably more than 10 years running, the bulk of money that's gone into private equity real estate funds has been where? Uh, I mean, core. Take, take a choice. There's only three. Core. Resident. Core. I say core. Opportunity. Yeah. Nobody wants 6%. Yeah. Everybody wants north of 20 so what happens if all the money's going over here? Are there enough investments? Are there enough opportunity type investments? To, the answer is no. And so what's happening is people are finally saying, hey, you know what? Um, yeah, we probably need to expect, you know, we either need to invest in something else or we need to lower the threshold here. Hold on, Kyle, because Nathan had a question and I'll come to you. Whether, whether one, an asset falls into one of these three categories, I mean, it's not like, written next to the description of the... No, 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 no. I mean, this is all sort of... These are descriptive terms to talk about certain concepts, okay? Um, a fund manager will tell you they are raising a $3 billion core fund. They'll say that, you know. They'll, and they'll tell you that by, by, by the, you know, yields that they're, that they're targeting. You know, I, I just subscribed to a fund that's definitely a value plus fund. And they're saying, look, we're targeting IRRs in a 12 to 15% range. And we're buying multifamily that's class B in tertiary markets, and our intention is to refurbish, rehab, retenant, and sell. Okay? So, Kyle. Um, did you, is that Starwood that you invested in? No, or? no, 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 I what, no. What is Starwood? What, what kind of, I guess. What is Starwood? No, like what kind of fund, or I guess what would you apply it as? Or value was revealed. Well, so so Starwood is an asset management business that has a lot of different tentacles. So yeah, they're raising five billion dollars or something. I I I likely somewhere down here, but Starwood, knowing Starwood, they may be raising money for a debt fund. This is equity I'm talking about. There's a whole other realm in debt, okay? And in debt, there's a whole bunch of other different descriptions. Whether you're, you know, you're you're doing, you know, sort of, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, sort of high quality high grade or you're doing you know high yield or you're doing some sort of alternative investments, right? Uh, you're gonna have a different return profile, you're gonna have less variability as well, right? So you're gonna be just basically distressed or or speculative or some sort of institutional level. Uh, Starwood if they're raising equities probably here. Now Starwood also manages a, a public mortgage rate. And it's really a hybrid because they have some equity investments, but they do a lot of debt as well. So uh, you really got to look at, you know, but like the guys you think of, like the Blackstones and all that, they're all playing here. Okay. So what was Kadena? We were, we were, Kadena, we were merchant developer. I mean, we were not, we were not an asset manager. Um, and we, other than for a, a very short period of time in our existence, never held on to assets. We developed, we took our promote, and we moved on. Um, as of now, we got to a point where we bulked up a little bit and then we sold the business, okay? So, but that was how. Now, along those lines, you brought this up, and this, I, I, I cut this one out because I think it's really, that, I'll, I'll say that one in a second. Um, yeah, uh, 7,150 store closures in, uh, in the country. 
last year. Uh, Cyrus One was one of the data center companies that um, um, I forgot to mention, but Cyrus One is buying a data center in Britain, Columbia, and Medical Properties Trust, which is a, 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 a medical, re, medical office re, is buying a stake in a Swiss company. And all I'm saying with that is, is people are going outside looking for higher returns than what they could get here. Most REITs, if you were to look at the style, most REITs in this country, equity REITs, are playing in a core space. Okay? They're, they're generating passive income. They're looking to generate dividends. And they're really prohibited from undertaking development activities. So they really can't play in as a, as a whole in, in value or opportunity type propositions. They really have to be in the core space. Class A assets, credit tenants, etc. Okay? Is that by law? No, that's just it's just you know it's pragmatic. You know, you, you know, you're generating dividends, you gotta be up here. You gotta have certain you know certainty, okay? Now by law you can only you can only generate passive income. So you gotta generate rents. Can't be doing significant development activities. I thought this was kind of interesting. We uh I don't know why I want to say this, but there's a company called Mac Cali, which is a a re sort of New York centric, primarily office. So when we sold the last company, we sold Florida East Coast Industries, we sold sold it to a, a, a an alternative asset management business called Fortress, which was publicly traded at the time as part of the whole soft bank thing now. And it was it started out well. It started out well. We had a really good real estate guy running and next thing we know, um, right after the acquisition, um, um, they hired a guy, I won't say his name, they hired a guy, we used to call him El Carnicero, the butcher. And, uh, and a guy came out of Lehman, and Lehman had just gone bankrupt. And the story, the story was that this guy was the personal banker, the CEO, it's like personal banker, the guy that had a relationship with the CEO at Fortress, and he's the one that would provide all the entertainment and all that for the guy. I don't know if that's true or not, but the guy was a pig. He was a total pig. I mean, and and I ultimately left because I just didn't want to work with that guy, and I didn't have to work with a guy. So you know, sometimes you're lucky, and you can say I don't need to do that. So I thought it was funny a couple years ago. So he disappeared. He didn't last very long. And uh, he shows up. He's the CEO of this Mac Cali now, and I see him on CNBC one day. And I'm thinking, here's the butcher, and this guy's saying, we got to turn this company around. I mean, this is all about how well you treat your customers and your employees. And I'm thinking, you got to be kidding me. This guy's saying that. So it's kind of interesting. They now, somebody's picked up the stock. It's been in a dumpster. It keeps going down. And now there's some activist group trying to take the company over, you know. And so he's fighting it and all that. But it's funny how um, you wind up, you see people, and you keep running on you know, running into them one way or another over time. Sometimes in a good light, sometimes in not so good. Now, uh, we had, I, there's three things I want to go over. You were going to remind me, which you didn't. I did now, I Yeah, but that was like 30 minutes ago, and I'm old, and I forget okay. those things. <laughs> One of the th performance bonds. So, what is a performance bond, and why? Because a lot of you cut and paste an answer. Oh, it's a three-way party, a you know, three-party agreement between a, you know, uh, a surety, you cut it out, right? No. And nobody used their own words, okay? What is a performance? And the most important thing is, is why are they used? And why are they relevant in our industry? I got a construction guy here that hopefully knows why, but maybe some of the other people don't know why. So let's go first. What is a performance bond? What's, what's a performance bond? It's a bond to perform. Give her, <laughs> who's got the scars here? Um, the third party bond, so the owners don't take excessive risk. When you say owners, so or let's investors. Okay, so investors. let's define let's define our whole thing. So we have we have somebody that's looking for some sort of security, right? We have somebody that needs to provide security, right? And then we have a third party that's gonna provide that. Okay? Now we can kind of take a look at this as an insurance firm, right? We can say, hey, I, um, well, but, but in insurance, you really only have two parties. I own a house, and I have a company that's going to, 
you know, assume the risk for that house. You know, I have a car, and I have a guy that is, is you know, needs that. Now, if, if we work in the development realm, I have an owner, okay, who's developing a building, and he's going to hire Suffolk. And he's going to say, okay, Suffolk, how do I know you're going to complete this work? Payment and performance bonds. Okay, so, so uh, the, the one difference, and the reason I talk about performance is, is this guy, well, so this guy, look, this guy needs it because he's going to pay this guy to build this, right? The construction company is going to come to the surety, right? It's kind of like an insurance company, but it's different. An insurance company pays. A surety pays and performs. A surety will step into the parties, in, in, into the shoes of this person, and fulfill, perform their obligations. So, it's a better one. I got a client, he has a bank. That's really why you, a lot of times you, you, know, you bond something. Right? The bank is going to say, okay, I'll give you a loan, but I need some assurance that this guy's going to complete the project. Okay? So, the construction company goes to the surety and says, okay, please provide this guy assurance that you're going to pay and perform in the event that I default. Okay? What happens with construction companies? They go bankrupt all the time. They go bankrupt in the middle of a project. What do you do? You stop. You right. So it's not just an issue of money. It's not just an issue of money at that point. It's an issue of walking in and taking the project over and completing it. Okay. Now, um, these sureties tend to be very, very difficult. Very, very difficult to deal with. Okay, and that really becomes an issue in differentiating a construction company, their capacity to bond, how much, and just the fact that they can bond. Because what these guys are looking for is is a certain level of of, of uh, ability here, you know. So a lot of times they will issue these bonds, but there's guarantees here. There are personal guarantees on the part of the owners. There might be financial instruments that are used to guarantee that. So you may have to put letters of credit up to guarantee that. So you'll entice the surety to provide the bond, but only based upon financial wherewithal. Now, we see it in construction. We see it a lot of times with municipal governments when people have obligations, developers have obligations to maintain infrastructure. I gotta keep lighting, I gotta keep road, I gotta do landscaping. Okay, so that there's an ongoing, ongoing obligation that a developer has, a municipality will ask the developer to provide a bond to ensure that they will carry out their obligation or their responsibility. Does that make sense? It's, it's sometimes we do JVs, right, to, to, to mi minimize the bond so that you can perform. Or, or so in, with construction companies, you, you see joint ventures for two reasons. One, so, so what's going to happen? So, I'm a, a, a construction company's ability to grow is going to be dependent upon their ability to bond. Okay, so their surety is going to say, okay, you, we'll issue up to hundred million dollars worth of bonds. That's how. That's what you're good for. Okay. So what happens is if you take a project that's hundred million dollars, you can't do any other projects. So you might do a joint venture and give yourself some capacity. The other thing might be is you may not, you may have a two hundred fifty million dollar job, and you can only bond up to a hundred. You got to find another company that can fill the gap. Do they actually come in and perform, or do they? Yeah, just I mean, I I was we just sold it, but I was in a deal where I forget, I forget the name it was like an Italian name. It's a company out of New Jersey, big construction company. They came down here, they started building a residential tower for us. And they came to us about three quarters of the way and said, look, it has nothing to do with this project. We've had big losses in other projects. Florida's not for us. We're just going to turn this over to the surety. And so, I mean, we fell behind a little bit, but, you know, we were covered. They came in, they brought another contractor in, and they performed. And they delivered the building. Well, yeah, no, no, for sure. 
And that's why they're very nervous people, they're very difficult people to deal with. So you think, you know, you could typically get an insurance guy to underwrite a deal. That's not that difficult. Getting a surety to actually provide a payment and performance bond and to give you, you know, bonding capacity is very, very difficult. Brian, you had a question. Yeah, so security would be the lender, the provider would be a business developer, and the third party would be the party to insure. The well, so you'll have, you, you'll have like with a construction deal, you'll have, you'll have a surety that provides the, the security, right? The, the, the payment and performance bond, right? But you typically will have an owner, and the owner typically has a bank or a lender or some sort of financial institution, right? And then you'll typically have a construction company, right? So what happens is a construction company pays the surety to issue this payment and performance bond. But the reality is, who do you think is paying for this? The owner. Yeah, it's just part of the, it's cost of construction. So, I mean, a lot of times, maybe there's not a bank, but then it, then, then it becomes a cost issue or a risk issue. How much risk does the owner want to assume? Uh, one of the things we used to do, because we used to self-perform a lot, um, we would ask certain key subs to provide payment. So we'd look at the envelope of the building. We'd look at the shell, we'd look at the, you know, the glazing, we'd look at the roofing, and we'd make sure those guys got bonded, okay? And then everybody else, like, okay, we didn't really care that much, you know? We figured we could minimize that risk, but there's a, there's a cost associated with it. Is that compound, does that compound, um, if, if, if my bonding capacity is a billion, do I, I take on, a lot of projects going on in place. Does my bonding capacity then is just the delta of that, or or, or do your I your, your capacity is going to be capped at a certain you know whatever the surety tells you. So if they tell you, look, we'll bond up to fifty million dollars worth of projects. It doesn't matter if it's one or if it's ten or five. But when you get to fifty, they won't issue any more. And until you're completed and their premium and performance guarantee is gone, they, they won't issue another one. And so that's why, I mean, construction companies are capped in their ability to grow by the bonding capacity that they have. And ultimately that talks to their sponsorship, who's the ownership, and, and what's their wherewithal, and how serious are they. Is it the bank that's, that's enforcing this? So it's not a bank, it's a surety. That's so right. So sureties are, are like insurance companies. In fact, some sureties are also insurance companies. Okay, but they, they are like a bank. I'm sorry, they are like, a, like an insurance company. They will come in and they'll say, okay, we'll issue that for you. We'll issue that for you, but we want a personal guarantee. So we'll issue a $50 million payment and performance line, but you gotta personally guarantee that. And they might say, and you gotta put $10 million, you gotta give us a line of credit of $10 million. Or $20 million, they might say $50 million. So you gotta go to your bank, and get them to issue a letter of credit to guarantee the surety. And the bank's not going to issue a letter of credit without you providing something to the bank. Okay, so, well, or, or a compensating balance or some sort of agreement. So, really, ultimately, you talk, it's a tough business, and it's, I don't want to say shady business, but it's pretty shady business, <laughs> right? Maybe not at a big company level, okay? Maybe well, we also bond subs, too. Uh, okay. But, but where I'm going is, is, you know, construction has always been kind of viewed as a sort of fly-by-night and all kinds of things happen that I, I don't even want to know about um, with materials and with quality and, and with shifting costs and I don't want to know any of that stuff, okay? So, yeah, you've never done that, right? You know, uh, but you just, you got to make sure that you got solid people behind there, okay? Somebody had it. Jeff. What's the driving metric that changes uh, construction companies surety bond? How can they increase it? Uh, it financial capacity of the owners. So they're NOI and then they're, they're No, I would probably say more like net worth of the ownership. So oh, okay. yeah. They're gonna look at the company, but they're really gonna take a look at the ownership. That's a huge I mean I, and that's just I mean I'm just telling you that that's from personal experience of fighting and trying to get additional capacity or trying to go to a different company. And, and these guys, I mean, I was warned when I started dealing with them, I was ah, I got this. You know, it's not that easy. It's not that easy. I, I, one, of, one of my buddies from high school 
did very well. He, he ran as he was part owner of a civil engineering business. They sold it, and then he wanted to create another company. And I mean, all our work is public work, and it, it all requires to be bonded. And he's essentially had to put his entire net worth at risk to get the, the, the bonding capacity in order to do the work. What, what do you mean, geo? General obligation bonds? No, 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 no. Payment and performance bonds, um, um, you know, they're, to their customers that are municipal entities. So they do road work, uh, you know, bridges, you know, toll roads, stuff where's, like that. Where's the risk in a, in a public um, project, like you're saying? Well, it's, it's a risk of any project that the owner doesn't, that means that the construction company doesn't perform or does faulty work or doesn't finish the work. Okay, so that's where the risk is. It's in that's the always the risk. So just, to, just to substitute the municipality for an owner, right? And substitute the bank for the taxpayer. The taxpayer gives the municipality money to go ahead and, and pay for road work. But you need to assure yourself that that guy's going to finish the work. Okay, we good with that? Okay, Oz, you had a question regarding, I wrote it down. Secondary, um, Primary and secondary markets. Okay. Oz asked me a question. Ask me the question. Ask the class a question. Um, Alibaba is going in, had trades on NASDAQ, and now they're, they're going into Hong Kong to raise another $20 billion. So I wanted to know when he was talking about dilution of shares, it, would that actually dilute the value if they offered more shares in Hong Kong? So there's there's two concepts. Alibaba, I don't know anything. I, I know it's like some Chinese like Yahoo or something. I have no idea. Uh, so like Chinese Amazon. Amazon. No Chinese Amazon. Okay. So Al Alibaba did a, a what's called an IPO, an initial public offering, um, three or four years ago or something, and they did that on the Nasdaq exchange, I think. Okay. Now I'm not going to go into. I know a lot of detail, but. So I did what's called an initial public offering. Um, I've mentioned in class that most times, most companies, when they go to, pub, to the markets, will only do that once. Uh, there's some exceptions, and I mentioned um, REITs being one of them, because they're distributing all their capital, and so they need to bring in new capital in order to grow. Otherwise, it can't grow. If you distribute everything that you have, you can't grow. Same thing with a construction company, right? You know, you spend all your money and you don't have any additional capacity to bond and you can't keep growing. Um, when we talk about stock offerings, we talk about two different things. We talk about something called primary and secondary markets. So when we talk about primary markets, we're talking about the company issuing stock to shareholders. So we're talking about the company going out and selling a portion of itself in exchange for funds coming into the company. Okay, so a primary offering is when the company issues stock and the proceeds come to the company. That's a primary offering. When we talk about an IPO, it's a primary offering. Now, sometimes some shareholders, existing shareholders, will sell some, some of their stock as part of the IPO, but for the most part, IPOs are primary offerings in which the company is selling stock in exchange for, for dollars, for money. What's secondary market? So, so secondary market is what provides liquidity, and it's the beauty of the public markets. It's what provides liquidity to the primary and makes the primary market, you know, exist. So, so secondary market is when seasoned securities trade hands not between the company and a shareholder, but between shareholders. Yeah. So I invest in an IPO in a primary offering, but now that I have the stock, I want liquidity, and I can sell it to Kyle, or to Armando, or to Alana. Yeah. That's a secondary market, okay? So that secondary market is what's providing liquidity that's making the primary markets realistic. Because people are going to say, hey, I'll buy stock there, but I, you know, when it's time, I want to be able to sell it or monetize it or when I want to get my money out. Okay, so, so, so the first thing is, let's distinguish between primary and secondary markets. Now, 
Uh, the company can also do a secondary offering, which is really a primary. They can issue additional shares. That is dilutive. If I, we, we've talked about that, right? So if, if there are 100 shares and 100 shareholders, each shareholder owns 1%, right? But if all of a sudden this company goes and issues another 20 shares, right? So now my, now there's 120, you're 1%, now you're, you own one share out of 120. You no longer own 1%, right? You own less than 1%. So to your first point, when they issue additional shares, there is an effect to dilute the existing shareholders. So yeah, so it is a dilutive. And so presumably each share is going to be worth less. So the asset side hasn't really changed, right? But there are more shares to distribute amongst, you know, that asset based amongst, right? That's number one. Um, so um, I, don't, I don't know why they're doing it, but I think they're doing it. It's a relatively small amount. And what they're trying to get at is some companies want to have multiple listing sites to provide additional liquidity to their shareholders. Okay, so some large companies, General Motors, Toyota, are going to list in multiple markets. Okay, and what they're trying to do is just make it easier for shareholders to transact. So Alibaba wants people in Hong Kong to be able to buy shares easily without having to buy foreign currency or use a broker that can get shares in New York or create you know, other products like the equivalent of ADRs. You know, we, so you can own like shares in Novartis in this country through an ADR, an American depository receipt. But there's fees associated with that. So if, I, if I'm in the US and I want to buy shares in a Swiss company, you know, it's a pain in the ass to go, sorry, sorry, to go, to, how do I go to Switzerland? I don't have a Swiss broker. You know, I'm not awake during those hours, right? So all they're doing is, is, is creating an additional market or additional value for their shares to trade. And some large companies just, you don't want to do that as a service to their shareholders. Well, they still have the... the the dilutive effect? Yeah, that, that because they're doing a secondary, absolutely. Now, they didn't have to do this. They could have, you know, taken the shares that were already in a sort of public domain and obtained a listing in Hong Kong. But maybe Hong Kong is forcing them to issue some shares. But I think it was a relatively small amount for the market cap of the company. Well, I don't know how much, how much it was. All I know it was $20 billion. Yeah, but like, what's the market cap of Alibaba? Like 400 billion or something like that, or 500, you know, so like, it's like the most valuable of the Chinese company. So, I mean, I, I don't think they were doing it to raise funds for the company as much as um, to get a multiple listing. Now, what, what you do see a lot of companies doing secondary offerings typically is so let's, let's think of Lennar. You know, Lennar was owned by Stuart Miller's father, Leonard Miller. So Leonard Miller owned, owned his home building business. He took it public. Let's say he owns 80% of the stock. It doesn't look good if you're a company that's going public and, you're, and your existing shareholders are selling their stock. Because what are people buying? People are buying management. So if management, if management selling their stock, they're going to say, well, why should I invest if you're getting out? So typically, in an IPO, insiders are locked out from selling. What will happen is sometimes after two, three years, a group of insiders or previous or existing shareholders will do a secondary offering in which they will offer a percentage of their shares in an offering but it's a transaction between the shareholders and the public, okay? The funds don't come to the company. So it's just existing shareholders selling a block of, ch of shares in the market. Does that make sense? Yes, Brian? How does a buyback benefit a company? A buyback. So, so does people know what a buyback is? It's a buyback. Is that like Indian giving? 
company buying back shares from the. When you're buying back shares, it's the company literally re good. repurchasing. I'll back. go with the synonym. You want to use synonym? Synonym. Re repurchase. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, how does a how does a company return? Hold on. Let me come back to that in a second. Let me just finish. I don't want to, so we talk about primary and secondary markets, or primary and secondary offerings, which have different sort of facets. We don't use these terms that much anymore. We, we used to have like the first, second, third, and fourth markets, okay? And so, which is a totally different concept. It's like a first market would be something like what the New York Stock Exchange used to be, where there were literally traders. You know, I'd call my broker, and he'd call his guy on the floor, and that guy on the floor would look for other guys and he'd say, hey, I have 100 shares. And the other guy says, hey, I have a client that has, wants to buy 100 shares. And they'd come together. And then there's kind of like this evolution to, to what's NASDAQ, which are sort of these electronic exchanges, which are more quote driven. You've got some market makers, right? So you've got maybe Apple might have 40 market makers. And they've got a, 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 a stock, a, a, an inventory of shares that they're willing to, to part with and they put a price on it. And so there's an electronic quoting and, and then you see what it is and you know it's all again sort of supply and demand driven. But there's no physical venue, right? I think we talked about third markets. They talked about um, um, transactions of first market um, shares that were done off market. And, and, and fourth market is really what today people call dark pools. They're totally sort of institutional transactions, block sales of stock that never never see the, the public domain. You don't know what the pricing is, you don't know what the volume is. It just sort of happens behind the scenes. And we'll talk about that in a second because now all of a sudden you lose price discovery here. Now people don't know what the real market value trading is. Okay? All right, now the question was buyback. All right, so so a buyback is when a company buys back its stock. But if we use a cinema, we say it's when a company purchases its stock. Okay, so what's the journal entry when a company issues stock? Company issues $20 billion worth of stock. What's the journal entry? What do they get? Cash. They get cash. So they, they get cash for 20 billion. What's what's the what's the what's the window side of that journal entry? Common, what's the door side? The common stock. The door side of that entry. Common stock? Yeah, equity. So it could be common stock or you know maybe it's common stock and paid in capital and so let's just say it's common stock right now, okay? 20 billion. And if we're going to make a balance sheet, right? And we're going to make a balance sheet now we've got 20 on the asset side, right? We've got zero liabilities and we got 20 of equity, right? Makes sense, right? Assets, 20. So our assets equal liabilities, zero, plus our equity, right? 20. So 20 equals 20, right? We all, we all good so far? You guys learned your accounting? Okay, now, how does a company return money to its shareholders? Yeah, or buyback. Well, oh, increased value of the, of the Well, they haven't returned anything. So how do you return funds? So the mechanism is what's called the dividend. The mechanism is what's called the dividend. So the company can can issue, can declare a dividend. And I'm not going to go through all the journal entries there. But ultimately, what the company can do is is do the reverse of this, right? They could debit equity, right? Or common stock or retained earnings, some equity account, and credit, cash, right? So they can distribute a billion dollars, right, to their shareholders, right? Now, most people do that as a function of the profits they make, right? But we're looking at a company that hasn't had any operations yet. But the company can return funds to its shareholders via a dividend, a distribution from equity. Is that clear? Does that make sense? 
Yeah? Now, financial engineer types say there's another way to distribute funds to shareholders. And then we're going to distribute funds to shareholders is, is we're going to go out into the open market and purchase their stock. Okay? So rather than doing this entry as a, as a dividend, they're going to go out into the market and buy something that's called treasury stock. Okay? They're going to buy shares that have been issued that aren't retired, and they're going to hold those. Okay? And they're going to pay X cash for it. So all of a sudden, what you've done is you haven't directly paid a dividend to the shareholders, but now you've cut the denominator to 19. So it's anti-dilutive, right? It's the opposite of dilution. Yeah. And so, now the question is, is, is this an asset? Mm. Hmm. How do you deal with this? Where do you put this on your... So now, now, you just got rid of a... a you only got 19 of cash. Yeah, you got some... And you got 20 of equity. Because you didn't distribute a dividend. So you got 20 of equity. How do you deal with that one? Long-term asset. It's a long-term asset. So you can invest in yourself. No, that's... So in certain parts of the world, people do that. And in certain parts of the world, management buys shares. They vote those shares in shareholders' meetings, and they control companies by controlling part of this treasury stock. We don't do that in this country. Huh. So how do we how do we deal with it? I think it's a shorter term asset. So you think it's shorter but term? There's a blank over there. You in the think top it's right. long term? Okay, it becomes a contra equity account. We say we reduce it from from common stock, from our equity section. Okay, we don't consider an asset. We consider it a reduction of equity. Now. There, there is a longer term tactic that companies can take that and permanently retire the stock. And if you permanently retire the stock, then you just reduce this to 19. Most companies actually leave the treasury stock on their balance sheet because it gives the reader an indication of how much they bought back over years. But the effect of buying back stock is saying, hey, we don't know what to do with this cash. And, and the way we're going to reward the shareholders, we're not going to directly give it to the shareholders. We're going to reward them by reducing the pot of shareholders that there are in the company. Which makes their stock more valuable. Well, it could do. There's, there's two effects, okay? There's multiple effects. The first one is you become a central bank in your own stock. So when Apple says, we're going to buy back $20 billion worth of stock, do you think they buy when the stock is high? No. So it's been under pressure. It's at 175. It starts dipping. What do you think this week Apple stock hasn't gone down? Because as it's going down, they start buying. So they become almost a market maker in their stock. So companies use it, I don't want to say manipulate, but influence their stock price. So that's one way that they do it, OK? Uh, one second. And the other part of your question was? Well, that's it. I said it makes it more valuable because you're... Well, and so what, what it does do is, is because you have a, a lower denominator, yeah. your earnings per share, all other factors being equal, is higher. Yeah. Same earnings, fewer shares to distribute by. So now you now your PE, without having done anything else, right, without having any kind of compression or expansion on your PE multiple, right, your stock should be able to substantiate a higher price. That's the theory. Yeah. Now, in practice, you also have fewer assets supporting that. But you had a question. Yeah, can a company itself buy more stock and be its own voting power? No, not in this country. I mean, in other countries, yeah, but not here. OK, um, somebody had a question. Yeah, Michael. Well, I just want to say like, an in interesting thing um, in the case of Apple with uh, the capital return that they're doing buyback and dividends uh, simultaneously. So the more buyback they do, um, the less costly it is to 
return dividends to shareholders well, because there's less you, shares you outstanding? Could, you, could, you could either increase, same dollars, you're increasing the payment to each share that's still right. outstanding, right? Or you can reduce the outlay of the dividend and maintain the dividend constant. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of effects to the buyback. I, I mean, from a purely financial perspective, I don't like that because it's, it's management saying, look, we can't do anything with the resources we're generating other than to dilute what we do. I mean, I'd like to see management invest in their business and grow more. It's kind of like, uh, I mean, some people say, oh, well, we think it's a, our stock is a great value, so we're going to invest in it. I mean, so anyway, now one last one, and then we got to get on with like really interesting financial reporting stuff. I have, I have a student sent me a, a question. I kind of wrote it. So this was my answer. His was a one line. Hey, this friend of mine told me about this place called Fundrise.com. What do you think? I should invest in it. He says it's really great. Right? Okay. So it was kind of like that. It was kind of like, hey, it's great returns. What do you think? Okay. So. What did I write back to you? A lot of questions. A lot of questions. So what were, what were my questions? Like, do you have to be a qualified investor? No, you don't. You don't? They do it through crowdsourcing, but the minimum amount is 500. So they do it through crowdsourcing. So the minimum amount is 500. 500 what? Dollars. So you don't have to be a qualified investor. Okay, so what's a qualified investor, by the way? What did we say? If you're going to issue securities in this country to the public, you have to register them under Securities Act of 33. The, at this point, there's a whole bunch of different ways in which you can circumvent that. The easiest way is to find a, quote, qualified investor. So that would be someone who's sophisticated, who can qualify themselves to be sophisticated, who has a certain minimum net worth, right? And as a result of that, you're able to sell shares to them without going through the public registration process, okay? You still have to provide a bunch of disclosures and have to exempt themselves. There's a whole bunch of Reg A and, and whatever Q and 144A offer. There's, now there's this Jobs Act that, that was at the end of the Obama administration. There's a whole bunch of different ways in which you can become a qualified um, investor. The problem with all this is I see it. So problem number one there, you know what I mean? So problem number one is, is we are going to continue to strip away the requirements for public offerings until what happens? Somebody rips, another Madoff comes along and somebody rips people off. And then people are going to say, where's the regulation? Where's the feds? And then we're going to get the Barney Franks of the world, you know, or whatever, come out and say, we've got to regulate this. So there's definitely been a relaxation in public offering requirements, okay? and find, finding ways of circumventing or eliminating the public offering requirements, the public information requirements. There's no doubt about that. So there are different ways. Um, I'm not an expert in this crowdfunding, so I don't know how that fits within these guidelines, okay? And crowdfunding per se is, I don't know that you're issuing securities, because a lot of crowdfunding is, you know, I'll give you a t-shirt or I'll sign my first record or whatever, you know? It's not necessarily equity. So, just saying crowdfunding... Well, they, have, they have three different portfolios and... I mean, no, 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 don't reach... Okay. You're supposed to bring all this stuff, not your phone. I have a screenshot of it, right? But you should have remembered this stuff. I mean, you're going to invest in this. You're going to put your money in this. Right, so I have three different uh, portfolios. A supplemental, which puts more dividends versus an appreciation. Hold on. Okay. Why don't we talk in the terms we just learned in this class that are what real estate investors talk about? There's a core portfolio. What else is there? Okay, the core. Let me go back to it. The value will be called balanced investment. Which there's a value portfolio, and there's a. And there's an opportunity. And there's an opportunity port. Imagine that. Look how much you just learned. <laughs> So these guys make up all these marketing buzzwords and you want to pay for it. But you just learned. Okay, so anyway, so I do. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, you quoted certain returns to me. Yeah. My question is, is he said, well, my friend says it returns from 8 to 14%. So my first question is, is during what time frame? Uh, from 2014 to 2000. But where did it say that? 
page of the website. On the front page of the website. What was the volatility? What's volatility? Hmm. What's volatility? Okay, so so let's 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 back up a little bit. When we talk about return, what is the other word that we always typically talk about? Risk. 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 Okay, so um, so so I, I want to define them in statistical terms right now, right? So when we talk about returns, ultimately uh, we can talk about returns in the context of a of a of a of a, of a normal distribution, and typically we're going to be looking at what we call expected returns, and expected returns are going to be some sort of measure of central tendency, okay, or mean. I, I want to go back to uh, something I said the other day in class. If I'm going to go to London this week, what am I going to do? I'm going to look at historical weather patterns in London to see, do I take an umbrella, do I take a coat, do I take a sweater, do I take boots? What's the weather like? Because history, while history is not necessarily a, 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 a final determinant on what's going to happen, it's the best thing we got. And we know that everything is a normal distribution. They taught us that in elementary school and in high school and, and in college and statistical, in statistics classes, right? We know that ultimately everything kind of <coughs> reverts back to a mean. So we look at measures of central <coughs> tendency means as a way of predicting the future. And so when you tell me that when you tell me that historical returns have been between 8 and 14 or 17 or whatever, I'm creating an expectation, right, that returns are going to fall somewhere where those past returns have been, right? Yeah. That's kind of what we have, right? And so when we talk about when we talk about, you know, measures of central <coughs> measures of central tendency, we're talking about historical averages. And we're going to expect returns to be somehow predicated or tied to historical averages. Now, um, there's something else we measure in statistics when we take a look at this, and that's what? It's dispersion. And what's dispersion? That the boundaries from... The so that's how nice far we travel from the expected central tendency or distribution, right? And so, so we're going to define in the context of finance risk as that variability or that volatility that's going to exist or that dispersion that's going to exist from central tendency. You, know, you can argue, you can argue that in investments you're worried about tail risk or negative tail risk, right? Your concern is not when returns exceed averages, your return, your risk is going to be when they fall below expected averages. But let's just say that, that overall, overall our risk is the risk or the possibility or the probability that the return is going to fall outside of our, our expected uh, um, return is. So uh, let's look at it really simply. I buy a stock. That stock, I'm, I'm expecting a 10% return. All of a sudden, the stock market drops 30%, and I got to sell. What did I just lose? A lot of money, right? Now, if I am a long-term holder of stocks, if I'm a long-term holder of an asset, typically I'm less concerned about volatility. But volatility is going to make me sensitive or aware that potentially, potentially, I may have a loss because I, I, I've, I've had this huge variability, right? It's 2007, I'm expecting a 7% return on my stocks, and it dropped 40%. And I got a margin call, and I got to sell everything. And I just lost 40% of my value, right? Okay? So when we talk about, and we measure, it's basically standard deviation, okay? So we're looking at standard deviation. Okay, so um, the, 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 the sort of theory is, okay, I got 8 to 14 percent, but how much risk did I assume? So the question is, is how much risk am I assuming to get those kind of returns, right? So that's the first question that I ask you. Now I ask you another question. Well, there are several other questions I asked you there, right? But 
But the one question that I would jump here is, is if I'm going to invest, right, question number one is, is how much risk am I going to assume for the return that I'm getting? What's the next thing that I'm going to ask is, is what alternatives are there? So when you take a look at what Fundrise gives you, do we take a look at what REITs give us? And during the same comparable time period? And do we look at how much risk we assume with those REITs? Or do we have access to other private equity measures or investment vehicles? And how much risk do we assume there? So when somebody says to me, hey, invest in this, okay, I'll take a look at what they're offering, but I'm going to contrast it with what other alternatives I have available. I have a building on Griffin and I-95. Okay, what am I going to look at? I'm going to look at the building, right? But I'm going to say, yeah, but University of 595 is much better. What do the returns look like there? What's the risk look like there? I'm not trying to pick on you. I'm just looking at you. You know, I'm not, you thought it was just simple. And you're like, I thought I was going to discipline that simply give you like a lot of questions. You know, so, but, but, but this, this is the kind of thought process I'm trying to help you, you know, formulate, right? Because you can look at it as a, but this is a private equity real estate investment. This is a realistic potential investment that we all in this class might have to face at one point or what might want to offer to somebody, right? And so when we're looking at the quadrant of real estate, right, when we're taking a look at public and private, you know, debt or equity or what you want, you want to do it the other way, however you want to do the grid, right, we're looking at private equity being a significant component, right, of the equity stack as part of the capital stock, right? We said, we said definitely that, that private debt was the single largest because real estate is levered how much? 70%? And most, and most of the debt is, is private, right? And, and most of the equity is private as well. So on the equity side, we do have public markets in both debt and equity, but they're smaller. So, you know, we're going to go reach out to a joint venture partner. We're going to look out, reach out to an institutional partner. We may want to do a limited offering. We want to do a syndication. We, we may want to do a, a you know, limited partnership or an LLC and bring in several investors, right? They're going to be asking these questions. Well, you know, how much risk am I going to assume, right? Now, they may not ask it in a mathematical sense like this, right? But they're going to take a look at the projects that you've done. And they're going to take a look at the returns that you've done, right? And you're going to say, okay, well, Brian's offering me this, but I can go to Starwood or, or Blackstone and get that. Or I go to the public markets and then just, you know, buy that. Yes, Brian. Well, how would volatility be measured on the sound side of the public market? Is it just the real estate market in general for private REIT? Or? Well, first of all, I, I had a question. Let, I'll answer that question in a second. Well, I'll answer that question right now. Okay, I'll answer that question right now. Do non-public companies have annual returns? Do they have annual holding period returns? Yes, not public size. Well, so the answer is yes. So they do have a return. Year one, they have a return year two? They have a return year three? Return year four? Can we measure volatility there? Other the returns. So so it's the volatility of that return. Now now, the next question that I ask you is, okay, so I'm going to ask, you wrote back to me, I'm going to pick on you now, I'm going to pick on you right now. He wrote back to me and said, you don't understand, Professor, this is an e-read. What is an e-read? Hmm. Online. Mm -hmm. But I mean, is it, well, why is it called an online read? I mean, I don't know what an e-read is. But that's, I did go to their website. It's an electronic, what's an electronic read? I mean, the problem is this is a buzzword. No physical presence? No physical, so how do you invest in real estate with no physical presence? So this is virtual real, this is like a crypto real estate business. We just invented something. I'm thinking, like, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm thinking God, you know. No, but, but the point I'm trying to bring is, these guys have this great, great platform, right? All these young, beautiful people on the website, all these catchy terms. Not sexy. Core, value, plus, opportunity. <laughs> what a balance, structure, this. E-read. I don't know what an e-read is. What's a read? 
E buildings. What's a REIT? We'll talk about what a REIT is a little bit later on. But a REIT is a tax election. So I don't know what an E REIT is, but it sounds catchy, right? It sounds catchy, right? But the real question then becomes is when we invest in, there's a one significant distinction that exists between the public and the private market. And what is that? I mean, there's one, there's a lot of them, but what's the most significant one? Liquidity. Well, liquidity. Liquidity is the most important one, right? Because we know that in the public markets, I can go online, I can call my broker, and I can, I can liquidate a position if I need to. If I invest in something that is not publicly traded, how do I unwind it? And then the next question we talked about the other day is, is what's the price discovery process for it? How much do I sell it for? So number one, who's going to buy it? There's no market for it. It's kind of interesting. There's a, there was an art, I didn't print it out, but there was an article yesterday about along the same lines. It's, it's essentially this, but with a less catchy you know, phrase. Non-traded public REITs. And, and, and they read is pushing all this stuff. Non-listed public REITs. So you can have private REITs. You can have companies that don't trade in the public domain that elect REIT status. But these are publicly traded REITs that, don't, that haven't registered with an exchange or with NASDAQ. So the question that I have is, at what price do you transact? By the way, how, did this, how do these people transact? So if you want to get out, how do they provide liquidity? Um, they penalize you if you try to take it out, I think, in four or five years. But they are the say-so. So if you want to pull out within five years, they have to find somebody else to purchase it, or you can't sell it. So, so they, 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 they offer to do a best effort, and what do they say that they will value it at? 33% discount to what the market value is. Mm. Mm. And what's the market value? Who determines the market value if there's no supply and demand? The last transaction. How does the last transaction get done? I mean, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? At some point, you got to go. And so that's, so there's no right or wrong, but that's the biggest problem that you have with any private vehicle. And that's why they're not really suitable for individual investors. Private equity is suitable for institutions and high net worth individuals, people that don't have a liquidity need. Now, we keep pushing the envelope for it because it sounds sexy, right? We all want to participate. Why is private, what, I gave you some numbers. Did you print them out? No. So what are historical returns in public equity versus private equity? I mean, I, had, I gave you like 30 year data that I've accumulated. I gave you stuff from 1978 to like 2017. No, no, don't look in your phone. I mean, you should know this stuff, right? We so roughly, real estate on the private equity side was like at an 8% return and about a 7% standard deviation. What do you think public markets? Public, I only had like from 1992 because there was a, so a period in the 80s that REITs were really down and out until about 2017. What, were, what was the return profile here that I gave you? I don't recall without looking my phone. Okay, well, but... But when, when we share knowledge, I mean, again, I'm not picking on you, man, but, but the purpose of this class is to learn at least concepts, not to memorize things, right? But, because I don't remember the exact number, but I know that the standard deviation was north of 20%. And the only point I was trying to tell you is, is there is a cost to liquidity. This is the NARI index. This is NACREF. What's NACREF? The National Association of Real Estate Investment Fiduciaries. Come on, man. You're in this program to learn all this junk, man. I mean, this is, this is the body that, that this is the, the lobby. This is the equivalent of NARI for all the private institutional real estate owners in this country. Prudential, MetLife, ING. Northwestern, teachers, okay? All the institutional investors belong to an organization called NACRE. What do they do? They provide information to NACRE so that we can create indices 
so that we can benchmark on how our assets are doing in comparison to the market. So that when we go out and do a, an offering and we say we're targeting 8% returns, we can also say, and historically our last three funds returned X, which beat the benchmark by Y. And people are going to say, hey, we like these guys. These guys are good. They use benchmarks and with specific benchmarks. And well, it stuff. creates benchmarks. So this is the this is like this is the provider of benchmarks in private equity real estate, right? So the, the only thing I'm trying to tell you here is, is is that private equity and public equity historically have very similar return profiles, at least over the last 30 years in this country. The one big difference is this has significantly more volatility. Now, why do you have to assume that? There's a cost of liquidity. You got to sell. You got to assume this risk. Now, there's a lot of reasons why that. You know, the, the, this is the, these things are trading a lot more like stocks. So you're starting to get return profiles much more similar to S and P than you are to real estate. Okay. There's also another reason why this is smoother. How, how does private equity get? How does it get value? Brian, how does it get value? What market? Real estate market. How do you how do you do that? I mean, how, what's the process by which one determines the value of a of a property in a real estate market? Appraisals. People do appraisals. So what happens when they increase with assets in, in the private domain? You you do appraisals on a periodic basis. What happens with appraisals? We go the appraisals are only good as as good as the appraiser number one, and number two. Um, they can be made as instructed, right? They, they can be, they, yeah. there's, there's, there's a way, I don't want to say that they're jigged or rigged, but there's a way to maybe smooth some of that, right? You maybe only have one price observation a year, not daily, right? So you already, just by number of observations, you're going to have less variability, right? Um, and also, um, um, you know, maybe there's a little bit more subjectivity in the values that are derived, okay? Isn't that fiduciary part of that term is supposed to um, kind of make the, whatever whatever statistics they come up with there, um, not bias? Well, yeah, but let me ask you a question. If the stock is trading, if the stock of Starwood is trading at $17 today, it's $17. We know that. If you hire me and I'm, I'm an appraiser, I want to give you my best opinion based on a series of facts, right? I mean, I'm not saying that people are necessarily not going to give you the right answer, but there's going to be a certain variability, let's say, that you're not going to get. I mean, the market tells you what the price is. This is some guy's best opinion based on, you know, is looking at three different approaches on how to value something based on some historical trends and assets that are very unique as opposed to a share, which yeah, is a share is a share. It, a share is a share is a share, yeah. and it's supported by its cash flow as opposed to you know this particular building in this location. Okay, so are you going to invest in it? Most likely. Okay, and why is that? Because I don't think they're going to sit there. I don't, think so, I don't think they're going to sit there and lie about their numbers because it could be easily found out. So regardless of the public trade or not, I don't think they're going to sit there with malintent and give you percentages. How many people invested in Ber Bernie Madoff's funds thinking exactly what you just said? He's a nice dude. He's a nice dude. Nice guy. Charts, benchmarks, all that stuff. So no, I'm not trying to dissuade you from doing it, okay? There are several people. There's been a, you know, with a... You know, the internet, there's been this, or there's another group called Cadre now. There's a bunch of people trying to do these similar things. Yeah, take a look at it. C A D R E. Um, Cardone Capital. Okay, mm. I mean, I don't know. There's, an, there's another group that's, I'll tell you one that seems a little bit more. I can't remember the name. I get their emails all the time. I forget what they're called. But anyway, it goes into my spam folder now, thankfully. But. Um, there's a reason why there was a securities law of 1933 and a securities law of 1934. 
just giving you my personal advice now, okay? So the reason why that happened, and there's something to be said for price discovery. Now, so the other two points that I just want to throw your way and say, so to sponsor this company, does not appear to really be a publicly traded company. What do you mean by sponsor? It's a company fundrise. So there's a sponsor and there are funds. So there is a company called Fundrise Inc. And they manage some funds, which is what you're going to invest in. You're not investing here. These people are going to earn fees from here. Okay. So this company, the sponsor, does not appear to be a publicly traded company to me. Now, they, they do have an offering circular out there, and they seem they seem to have they seem to have issued some shares in a public domain under either the Job Act or something where they there's really there's really not a lot of information available. Okay, they're not profitable. They're trying to raise like twenty million dollars, which best I can tell they've not been able to raise. They claim on the website to be managing several billion dollars worth of assets. And I, I see there's some incongruence here to me between the size of the sponsor and what they're purporting to. So I would look at that. They're also audited by some firm I've never heard of. <laughs> so I, I'm not, you know, I'll tell you, if these guys were backed by like a real, so these guys should be backed by like, what's that guy, Mayo San or whatever, the guy from SoftBank or something, you know? You know, you, you get KPMG to audit you, you, you'd have Morgan Stanley do your offering, I mean, you wouldn't do it under the Jobs Act on your own, okay? You'd have some, hmm, some girth to you that say, hey, maybe these guys are for real, you know? I think that cadre seems to be better sponsored, but that, I don't know that that necessarily means it's any better. But anyway, so those are just a whole bunch of, so all collateral, but we brought in a bunch of concepts that I think have to do with, you know, with what, what this class tries to teach you. And at the end of the day, you take those kits, you know, that toolkit, and you make your best, your, your, your best go of it. The only warning I would have is non-public investments, okay, non-public investments have no liquidity, have less transparency, and inherently have a lot more risk associated with them when you're an individual investor. Okay, so if you advice, my advice, you want to invest in real estate, look at the REITs. This guy's very public or private? No, it's, it's the same garbage. I don't even know that they've done anything. It's, so, anyway. Let's talk about development accounting. Hold on, let me. Uh, Alexander, you came in? Yeah. <laughs> Marina, you came in, right? Yes. Christina, you came in. Jeffrey, you came in. <coughs> Sean, you came in. Michael, you came in. And Jeff, we'll see this week. Okay. We got that done. Okay. So the, the, the topic I want to talk about today is development costs or accounting for development costs or how do you reflect development costs in the financial statements of a real estate company. Uh, Jeff, Jeffrey, I think, Jeffrey, was it you who asked the question why development costs might be important or relevant the other day? Like why would we look at, somebody asked, somebody in this general area asked, what, like what did I mean why development costs might be relevant? Well. So we've already talked about the fact that real estate is a capital intensive business and it lends itself to joint ventures because people don't want to assume the risk or don't have capacity. Uh, it involves significant components of debt. And so um, you know, it's important to understand how financial statements are presented. And ultimately, stakeholders are going to want to understand results at the end of the day. I mean, if I'm in a joint venture, I want to know how I did. I want to know how my partner did. I'm a lender. I want to know how my how my my creditor is doing, okay, uh, et cetera. And so uh, we can't follow traditional 
financial statement norms. Most companies, most companies, almost all companies assume that the normal cycle of their business is how long? One year. Most companies report a calendar year, right? Most companies, most companies happen to go, they happen to follow the natural calendar year. They go January 1 to December 31, right? Some companies don't follow that, but most companies tend to reflect one year as their normal operating cycle. Is one year a normal operating cycle for a real estate development business? So, so you know, if we were to follow the normal accounting for a typical real estate development company, we might have huge loss year one, huge loss year two, huge loss year three, and all of a sudden, year four, we have huge profit. Bunch of sales and no costs. Here, a bunch of costs and no sales. And one of the things that we like to do in accounting, we like to focus on what we call a matching principle. And what we try to find is a way that we can match revenues with our pertinent costs so that our reader can understand what the results have been of our, of our efforts, of our operations. So if we're building a high-rise condo tower and we're going to sell it, we, we, what we're going to want to do is accumulate the costs in such a fashion and so what, when we realize the sale, we can properly match those expenses with the sale to figure out if we made money or not. And if we did, how much money did we make? Okay. So, so the first thing that you're going to sort of realize is when we take a look at, at, at accounting for development costs, we don't recognize those as expenses in the current period. We are going to, for the most part, and there's a whole series of concepts that we're going to go over, for the most part, we are going to defer or capitalize those costs on our balance sheet for a future period to then match them with the revenues when we recognize the revenues. Okay? Um, this is, so, you know, I won't ask you this question, but this is covered, this hasn't really changed. This is pretty much all going back to what's called FASB 67, which was issued in 1982. There's a couple other FASBs that again deal with this. Construction period interest is dealt by FASB 34, and it sort of tucks into this conversation. That also hasn't really changed. And there's, there's FASB 144 that talks about fair value. We talked about fair value in, uh, in a little bit. Uh, that was one of the questions. I didn't go into the answer the other day, but in a case study with, with home builders, okay? So, um, I kind of did some notes, but basically what the concept is, we create a bucket. You may not realize this, but this is a bucket. Okay? So what we're going to do is put costs into the bucket. And then this bucket's going to sit there until we're ready to empty the bucket. And we're going to empty that bucket when we recognize the sales. Okay? Now, a few concepts I want to talk about. I will talk about ABC. Acquisition and development costs. So what goes into the bucket conceptually are acquisition and development costs. What are acquisition and development costs? Well, I mean, I could define it in a bunch of different ways. I could say they, they are hard costs or soft costs, but those are more for a generic industry type term. So when we talk about hard costs, what do we typically talk about? Land, materials. Construction. Construction, okay. Yeah, it could be direct materials into a project. What would we typically refer to as soft costs? Architectural. Anything other than hard costs, right? But it would be, it could be A and E, it could be permit fees, you know, it could be feasibility so, studies. So, so feasibility studies. So conceptually, conceptually, we've got cost to build, and we've got a whole bunch of other costs. But but in accounting terms, we don't really talk about these that much, okay? ABC costs, acquisition and development costs, can be defined as hard or soft, but we're going to talk in different terms, okay? The first kind of thing we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about pre-development costs, and we're going to talk about development costs, okay? Or pre-acquisition costs. I'm going to define, I'm going to do this up before class started, I'm going to define our development period as one having some unique or specific um, um, periods, okay? 
So a development is definitely going to have a genesis. It's kind of like a ray, you know? Hopefully it's like a ray, right? You know, that keeps going. It has a starting point and it hopefully doesn't end, you know? But, you know, but as it relates to us, there is definitely going to be a period in which we acquire something, right? Now, in the context of our acquisition and development costs and what we need to defer, we really don't take a look at the day that we acquire a parcel of land or a building. We look at the day that we concept, okay, that development. And from the minute that we concept that development going forward, our development period starts and our capacity to start putting costs into the bucket increase. So basically from a pre-development perspective, any cost that is directly identifiable to a project, okay, directly related with the acquisition of the, of the project, and the acquisition is probable, so if it's directly identifiable with a project, and the acquisition is probable, we must capitalize those costs. So we don't have the option to capitalize them, we must capitalize them. I'm going to say, you know what? We're going to, those, those are all part of this development, and we're going to match that with the revenue in the future. Okay? Now, what happens if we capitalize some of these costs and we don't go through with the acquisition? Then we recognize those as a loss or an expense. Okay? But while we're undergoing a feasibility pro process, as long as we perceive that this acquisition is prob probable, we're going to defer those costs. Okay? So that's number one. Anything that would be directly identifiable, that would be capitalizable as a concept, that we're going to go through the concepts now, and the acquisition is probable, it's going to go into the bucket. Okay? So pre-acquisition or pre-development costs, they're going into the bucket. Okay? Now, when we talk about the development period, we're basically going to say anything that is a direct cost of the development, any direct cost associated, as a rule of thumb, any direct cost associated with the development, we're also going to put into the bucket. We have to put it. We must put it into the bucket. Okay? If it's an indirect cost, okay, now we've got to take a look at how indirect or how directly you know, related is. There's some guidance on some specific concepts that we want to talk about, but let's, what could be an indirect development cost? So a, a direct, well, <laughs> traveling to meet with consultants, well, why are you meeting with the consultants? So that would probably be direct, right? So let me give you probably the most, I've got a development team, i got a development department. That development department is working on ideas, due diligence, actual projects, right? So they're doing a bunch of different things, right? So now the question starts, going, okay, well, can I allocate part of that cost to the development, you know? Can I, can I say that some of these indirect costs are really related to the development? You gotta be careful. I, 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 when I first got out of college, I did an audit of a, of a, of a company that they basically, they took up the very liberal view and they said, hmm. we only exist as a development company, so every cost that we have is related to development. Hmm. And so basically what they said is, is our receptionist, our rent, all of my travel and entertainment, that's all development cost. But what happened? <clears throat> they deferred all that. Well, they had a lot of expenses and not a lot of revenue. And when you know, push came to shove, they wound up showing huge losses. Okay? Uh, there's another extreme. When we sold our company to Florida East Coast, when we sold Kadena to Florida East Coast, they had a perspective where, number one, they didn't, they didn't uh, capitalize any pre-development costs, and they didn't capitalize any indirect costs. <coughs> I had a huge conversation with their with their tax but with their with their KPMG audit partner on that, and his point to me was, look, it's in, it's immaterial, it's wrong what they're doing, but it's immaterial. It's it's a small amount of money in comparison to the size of their balance sheet and their operations. But but you must, GAP tells you you must defer these because if you don't defer them, you're really never going to know whether you made money or not 
on a project, okay? So now we've said, we've said pre-acquisition costs that are directly tied to the project, identifiable in its project, we're going to capitalize. A probable, we're going to capitalize. Direct costs, we're going to capitalize. Indirect costs, to the extent that we create some relationship and not, not go overboard, they go into the bucket as well. How about general and administrative expenses in a company? Should they be capitalizable? Should we defer them? I'm incurring them now. What are general and administrative expenses? A receptionist, my accountant, you know, uh, my secretaries. This is tying it to a specific project. Corporate overhead. What is your payroll? Yeah. Corporate overhead. Not payroll? Well, I mean, it could be payroll, right? But it could be dues and subscriptions. It could be my internet service. But not at the project site, at a corporate site. The literature tells us no. You do not. You do not. Those are current period income. And so what we don't want to do is defer things that are not related to the development for a future period. Because then all we're doing is deferring losses. Really. Okay? What about property taxes and insurance, which would be significant in a real estate development? How should we deal with those? Those would be hard. Yeah. So those go in the bucket during the development period. Only during the development period. Once the development stops, we stop. What about interest? Construction period interest. Yeah, during the during construction. So during the construction period, there's a formula. 34 tells us how to do that. You don't need to get into that. But during the construction period, same as property taxes, insurance, and interest during the construction period are going to go into that bucket. What about cost to sell? What are costs to sell? Marketing costs. <coughs> It could be brokerage fees, it could be signage, it could be marketing material, it could be television ads, it could yes. be billboards, yes. it could be models. You say yes. You say yes. If it's tied to the project. Yeah. I mean, signage is a material for the project. Okay, so you're saying yes. Sign and yes. Sign and yes. 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 Okay, I'm not saying no. I'm just asking you to sure. They're like freaking really expensive. <laughs> okay. So when we talk about cost to sell, we talk about three concepts. We talk about included. We talk about excluded. And we talk about deferred. Okay. For the most part, when in doubt, for the most part, marketing costs are excluded. For the most part. And the reason they're excluded for the most part is because there's a very difficult way to tie a direct relationship between a marketing cost and revenue. For example, TV advertising, radio advertising. You don't know what effect it's really having. And so the conservative thing to do is, is recognize that as an expense. Now, what can you include? Permanent signage. Okay, models, you know, you're doing a multifamily or a single family development and you're building, building models, okay? Uh, stuff like that you can include. And what could be deferred? Any prepaid sales commissions, okay? But I would tell you as a rule of thumb, for the most part, any marketing costs, are deferred. Now, I'm not going to tell you that if, if you're doing marketing, you're doing advertising, it's not going to have a direct effect, but it's very difficult to tie it and measure it. So we typically are not going to include that. We're going to incur, incur that as a current period expense. Okay? What are incidental operations? Incidental operations? 
Like what? No, 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 no. I'm thinking something totally different. Something that's incidental to what you're doing. Something that would be collateral to what you're doing. So, um, for example, who's ever, some of you guys, you, 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 you got a big chunk of land, you're developing part of it, somebody rents a parking lot from you for, you know, part of a thing. Uh, I had some, we had a driving range, you know, we owned a chunk of land and we had a driving range for a golf course. You know, they, they lease some land from us, okay? Uh, so. An incidental operation is any additional revenue that you may be incurring or generating from a from a, 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 a part of your development parcel. Okay? And what the literature says is if it's income, if it's income, you're gonna throw it in there and you're gonna reduce it from the development costs. And if it's a loss, you're gonna record it as a current period income. Now, if it's a loss, you probably wouldn't do it. Can you that please? Yes, so an incidental operation is something that's collateral to your development. It's not part of your development process, but it's helping you generate some revenues. If it has net income, you're gonna reduce your development costs by it. If, if it's a loss, you're gonna recognize that loss as a current period loss. Okay? What are amenities? Are those those little fish that swim around? Or those are anemones? Manatees are big. But you know, this morning, we're not on the boat to check it out. What time did you wake up? 5.09. Five, five oh Without an alarm, mind you. How many hours? No, I don't know. Like, I went to sleep like around 11 or something. Four foot shark. Just like... In a coastal or in the bay? No, in, in the bay. I, um, Thursday I was out paddle boarding and there's a guy, they're doing construction next door. And there's a guy, there's a guy like this thing, like you know, he's got a line out and he had like a three foot shark. But this one today was like four, little nurse sharks, you know? I like the sandbar, they're all, they're all out there, I, you know, I'm just telling you. Okay, so amenities, what are amenities? Armando, what's an amenity? Like oh, where do you live? You live in Doral. Yeah, yeah, the amenities is like a, yeah. not a service, but like a, I think I was the one looking for. It's not a service, but you're close. No, no, I can't think of the one we're looking for. Uh, it's like an amenity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Security? Like a gym, an amenity. Okay, so yeah, so they, they, are, they are like additional, they're yeah. like some sort of benefit that you may get. So a pool, a clubhouse, a golf course, a tennis court, right? Something that a developer throws onto a project to, to enhance the value, right? So we think that the cost of amenities should be included in, in, in development costs. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That goes into the bucket. Okay, now, I left something out the other day because I was going to cover it today when we went over leases. Cost to rent. So we, we talked the other day about certain costs to rent, right? We talked about, what were the costs that we talked about four general concepts related to leasing. What do we talk about? Well, leasing commissions, leasing commissions, tenant improvements. What else did we talk about? Revenue recognition. That was a different subject at a different time related to sales. I'm talking about leasing. Straight line lease. Incentives and abatement. Okay, we talked about incentives. Yeah. Okay, we talked about incentives. And abatements. And we talked about abatements. And we, we said abatements were not really a cost in the sense that we were dispersing funds, but it was definitely a reduction of revenue over time. Okay? And so what we said, and we introduced the concept, Ryan, of straight line leases. We did say that from an accounting perspective, we recognize revenue of leases on a straight line basis. We sum the lease stream during the period and divide it by the number of years, right? The number of periods, and we recognize a straight line, okay? Revenue. But related to the three previous costs, leasing commissions, TI, and incentives, what did we say that we did? 
How did we treat those? Did we incur them as an expense right away? No. No. We defer those and we amortize them how? Over the lease term. Over the lease term. Okay? Now, so, so we talk about cost to rent. We already talked about those the other day. But there's an additional concept I want to talk about, and I'm going to go back to my development type one, timeline. And I want to talk about a concept called stabilization. Has anybody heard stabilization? What is a development project over? So you're telling me your development is over when you get a certificate of occupancy? Disposition. Disposition? When you sell it. Well, what if you sell it 20 years from now? It's, it's over. What if you develop? Then it's over. No, it's over. No, it's definitely <laughs> over at that point. But it may have been over a little bit before that too. <clears throat> yes, Anthony. Is it when you're you reach a stabilized um, occupancy, let's say 95 percent or something like that? Okay, so so he's kind of playing. So so it's not at the CO. It's at some point later, maybe. Okay, that's possible. Could it be a certificate of completion? Could it be at a TCO? Could it be a temporary certificate of occupancy? No. It has to be in a CO? Okay. So if you're doing a build to suit for sale, or you're doing some sort of product that you're selling, obviously the sales date is going to be the end of your development period. But when you're leasing, when you're developing to lease, we're going to say that, yes, we may have finished construction and we may have tenants move in when a CO is issued or when a TCO is issued, okay, we may have leases beginning, but we're going to say the development period extends beyond that date to something that we call stabilization, okay? And so we're going to be able to put all these costs into the bucket up until the end of stabilization. Now, in theory, most of these costs will have already been incurred by the time we get a CO. By definition, property taxes, interest, and insurance are not going to go into the bucket beyond the construction period, okay? And uh, we, we should have cost to sell at that point, right? We should have stopped incidental operations. We shouldn't have any amenities, you know, or we should have already accounted for those. And so basically what you're gonna have here is, is what we're gonna call a rent up or a, develop or a uh, stabilization period deficit, okay? And what accounting says is, listen, yes, there's a development period, but that development period doesn't really end until your building is stabilized. Now, there's no accounting literature that tells you what stabilization is. You threw a number out there that said 95%. There's no hard and true number. But stabilization, I'm going to define number one as a period that is a max of one year after your CO. Okay? So maximum one year after your CO, okay? And it's gonna be at some point where, where your normal occupancy rate is. At Flagler, we used to say, we're going to stop capitalizing at the earlier of 80% occupancy or one year. Some companies may use 95%, some may use 70%. You know, there's gonna be some measure where you're going to say, we're going to continue capitalizing costs. And typically, the costs you're going to capitalize at that point is going to be any deficit. At that point now, you're really no longer incurring development costs. Now you're incurring operating costs of the building. You've got to run all the services. You've got to do all the maintenance. You've got to pay the insurance on the building. You've got to pay the janitor. You've got to pay utilities. You've got to do landscaping. And what the development literature says is, to the extent that the rent that you have during this period, during this rent up period, does not cover the expenses, you can defer that loss and include it in the bucket. So that rent up period is going to go into the bucket as well. That rent up deficit. Okay? One of the few times in, in accounting literature where you can actually take a loss and defer it. Yes, Ryan. Maybe I'm jumping ahead. Is there a lifetime because a lot of these capitalized costs, are they as, how long do you have to? Well, so you have them until, if you're selling an asset to your CO and your, and your close, right? Right, once you finish construction 
and it's ready for its intended purpose, if it's held for sale, you should no longer capitalize any more costs. Your development period is over. If you're developing to lease, the literature says is you've got a maximum of a year after your, 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 your CO in order to continue to capitalize expenses. Is it advantageous for you to maintain, to keep the bucket open? open well, I mean, that year? it should neither be advantageous or disadvantageous. What the accountants are trying to say is, is, is if, you're, if you're leasing, if you're building something to lease until you really have it ready, you're not going to have it ready for its intended use until the tenants have occupied it. And so what they're saying is, is the cost to operate the building while you're getting tenants in it is really part of your development process. And so your basis in that building is going to include that rent up deficit period. So it shouldn't be advantageous or disadvantageous, it just is. Okay? Um, other things to keep in mind, um, options on land. They're part of your costs, okay? Uh, environmental issues. What are environmental issues? Buy some land, all of a sudden we discover that it's contaminated. Well, you know, in theory, their costs to remediate are going to be included. Now, that's all subject to fair value, and I'm going to talk about fair value in a second. Um, okay? So now everything goes into a bucket. Now, how do we distribute that bucket? So the easiest thing is I'm building one house, and I only got one bucket, and I only got one revenue. It's real easy. So I can use direct identification. I can directly identify all the costs of that sale to this bucket. That's easy. But now I got a multi-year, 600 acre parcel of land that has some land sales here, some out parcel development here, some multifamily development here, some single family development here. How do I deal with all? How do I distribute all those costs? How do I allocate to each individual sale all the costs that went into the bucket. Does each one have a bucket? Well, I, I, some costs are going to be common. I paid, I, I bought 600 acres at once. Okay. I did infrastructure for all 600 acres at once. Okay, so you, you, hold on. Well, so phasing is going to play a part of this, right? I mean, at the end of the day, you got to do this in some sort of program or spreadsheet, and you're going to have incurred costs and you're gonna to have to estimate costs because not all is gonna be you know you're not you're selling you're not doing all the infrastructure at once so you gotta have a spreadsheet going on where you're continually estimating what it's gonna cost you to complete the project because you're gonna to want to allocate costs including all your costs to complete. Now when you say percentage what do you mean percentage? Yeah which percent of the land so you're talking about floor area, floor area ratio? Yeah. You spend 100 million in the land. And you, and you divide it by acres. Okay. Any other ideas on that? Well, yeah. I don't know if there's setbacks and stuff. Well, I guess floor area. Yes, Anthony. Would it be by type of usage? <laughs> when you say by type of usage, what you, so how do you, so, if you say by type, I've got retail and multifamily, how do I distinguish? Through, well, if, let's say you're doing it through the different phases and there's different types of uses that are going into those separate phases, wouldn't they also be structured similarly to how, for example, Styles is structured? They have their own kind of network of organizations within yeah, the they're all, yeah, yeah, but how do I distribute the costs? Yeah, they're all different, but... So how, how much do I allocate to each area? Gross and net acreage. So I, I, I got, well, so I got gross and net, but you're, I'm still coming back to, Ryan, you had an idea. I'm still coming back to square footage or floor area, area ratio. So based on each revenue source, like let's say house in it, you would kind of use the, the prorated. So, you're, so did you just say relative sales value? I might have alluded to it. You might have alluded to relative sales value. Yeah. So, so that if we have a parcel where 
the retail bit here is worth a million dollars an acre and a, you know, a limited service hotel here inside is worth half a million dollars an acre. I'm going <coughs> to allocate more costs to that than I'm going to allocate to this. Is that what you're saying? Or let's take a look at a high-rise multifamily project, right? How much do you sell the penthouse for? A lot. A lot. How much do you sell the bottom floor for? Not so much. Not so much. That's a lot. So I need to allocate more to this one, right? Because what if I don't? What sells first in a multi in a high rise, for example? Top one. All these. You sell all this. So if you don't allocate a relative value to those. What's going to happen down here? You're going to make a bunch of money here, and you're going to lose a bunch of money here. So in accounting, we use a relative sales value. So we take the relative market value of the different components, Anthony, of the different components, and we allocate the cost based upon that relative market value. Okay? We don't use floor area, area ratio. We can as long as the market value approximates it. If they're all sort of of equal value, then we could use square footage, okay? But, but we must use relative sales value to distribute it. Now, mechanically, what happens, I go back to, this is a spreadsheet and you're continually updating cost, cost to complete, and sales. Because hopefully sales values go up as time goes on, but they may, they may go down as well. So you're continually, anytime you're recording the cost of a sale, you're kind of going to your model and saying, okay, this how much has gone to the bucket, this is how much more still has to go to the bucket, and this is the revenue model for the bucket. Okay, I sold this acre, it, I should, I should, you know, I sold it for a million, it cost me $850,000. Okay? Yes, ma'am. So the revenue value is directly... The relative sales value. A relative sale, sales value is directly tied to the, yeah. the preferred yeah. amounts. Well, no, it's not directly tied, it's up. So so let's say that it cost me a hundred to build this tower. Yeah. Okay? And let's say that I only have three units, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay? What I would say is is okay, well let's let's make this one one also just to make it easy, okay? So I would say, okay, I have four of total value, right? This unit is going to get 50 of cost, this unit is going to get 25 of cost, and this unit is going to get 25 of cost. Okay? And basically what you're doing is you're saying everything in your project is going to have the same gross margin. That's basically what you're saying. You're not going to have a higher gross margin with this one than you're going to have with this one. Okay? And the pur again, the purpose of this is, is, is what happens in a long-term project is the more valuable pieces are going to be sold first, and so if you don't harmonize that gross margin, you're going to have a lot more profit at the beginning of a project, and at the end you're likely going to have some losses. Okay? Um, other concepts. So there's one other concept that I want to... So you put stuff into this bucket all the time, but at the end of every uh, accounting period, you must assess what I'm going to call the net realizable value or the fair value of that bucket. Because I said the other day, inventories, inventories are always stated at the lower of cost or market. It's because we're conservative as accountants, principle of conservatism, because we're conservative, we are only going to recognize on our balance sheet our cost to the extent that the market value is greater than that cost. If the market value is lower than the cost, then we have to do an allowance, a fair value allowance. Now, that's where FASB 144 comes in, and basically it says, basically it says, how do you assess fair value? You take your bucket, right? So you've got all these costs to date, right, in your bucket, right? So the first thing is you're going to say is, what are my undiscounted revenues, expected revenues, okay? Undiscounted. We don't do present value in accounting. 
What are the undiscounted revenues, right? We subtract, subtract from that our expected cost to sell, okay? To get to a net undiscounted revenue, okay? And then we say, okay, we put our bucket, cost to date, plus cost to complete, right? If the total of this is greater than zero, we don't have a fair value problem. If it's less than zero, we have a fair value problem. It's very simple, sales less cost, right? We have a fair value problem. We don't stop capitalizing, okay? But we have to create an allowance on our balance sheet, okay? And that's what all these home builders did in 2008, 2009. Those that looked at, at home builders the other day that had fair value or asset impairment issues, okay, that's what they had to do. They create an allowance to reduce the value of this. Market comes back, things get revalued, you just keep repeating this every year at the end of every period, okay? Undiscounted revenues, less expected cost to sell, you subtract from that your cost to date plus your cost to complete. If it shows you're going to have a profit, you do not have a fair value problem. If it shows that you're going to have, you're going to show a loss, you have a fair value problem. And because, going back to commitments and contingencies, five, fast be five. If we know that um, we've got a fair value problem, we got to recognize it now. Okay, so we create an allowance. What is recognizing it now? And you're recognizing it on your income statement. Mm -hmm. That means you you incur a loss That's on right. your income statement. This is not ever an, an asset, an asset impairment loss. Yeah. Okay, it's 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 what you see companies adding back all the time. Oh, we've had an asset impairment, but that's not really part of our normal operations. Well, it is or it isn't. But anyway, okay. Questions? It's everything you wanted to know about development costs. Does it make sense? I mean. Just, I mean, I know you know. I'm not asking you to be accountants, but you know, kind of makes sense. Okay. Why don't we take a break till 10:30? Okay. Oh, really? Yeah. I slept great, but I just got confused. How many milligrams do I? Ten. Not too big. Okay, all right. That's a lot for me. Ten times? How much are they each? I think that's a standard dosage, right? I think that's two. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm really feeling it. Because it's hard to go to bed so early, like wake up at 6 I was like trying to force myself to go to bed at 6 Yeah, yeah. yeah. From reversing these asset impairments, because all of a sudden land <laughs> <laughs> okay, or their expectation of future revenues on the sale. So, but that's what accounting forces you to do is reduce the value of the asset, and if it comes back, you bring it back up by adjusting the allowance. You always keep capitalizing. And unless you're an accountant, it's harder, but you know. But just stop to think, if you've got a fair value problem, you've got to recognize a loss. That's what you have to remember. Your assets are paid. Okay? Do me a favor. Don't use the phone while we're in class, please. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. You can use it now, but not when we're in class, please. Thank you. I was using it to, uh, to read the definition. So I was using a definition of marketing costs.
Martinez. I went to my parents' it's house. Martinez, George. Because I got to evacuate Key Biscayne. So they didn't have air conditioning. And one of my neighbors stayed in Key Biscayne. He says, hey, we have power. So, you know, my parents are older and stuff. So we went over there with a dog. And I went with my nephew. And like, it was a mess. You know, like, the you know, tide comes in. So I, I mean, I had a horrible headache. I spent like three hours with some of the neighbors cleaning up the whole condo. I did that. And in the midst of all that, my nephew <laughs> walks by, and, and I said, listen, the Win dixies open, so why don't you get some? So, yeah, I didn't really think much of it, but all I kept thinking is when I'm done, I'm going to walk over there and grab some beer. Anywhere. So, I mean, I'm all sweaty and all, and it's like 6.30, and I go inside the house, I'm like, I'm done. And I said to my nephew, look, I'm going to go over to Win dixie now, and he goes, oh, no, it was closing at 6, I forgot to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know a little kid that's like, yeah. And I'm like, you didn't work. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, that wasn't what I was expecting. I was expecting him to say I bought the last beer. <laughs> okay, it's 10.30. And, yeah. So what are we? Um, <laughs> Ten thirty nine, fifty seven, fifty eight, fifty nine, ten thirty. If you have a doubt, look ten thirty. My watch says it. This is a there's a there's a there's an elementary school at, at the church where I go, and it says uh, they have a clock outside, huge, and it says Saint Agnes official time. And the problem is that it's you know it's all Latin people live there, and everybody's on their own clock, right? So. There's an official clock that tells when kids are late or not late. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm gonna uh, let's jump and cover the case study because I, I think it I think it's uh, relevant. I, I did want to make some observations <laughs> before. <laughs> I've restructured. Class. Class. Bam. Class. <laughs> Brandon, you don't want me to ask a question on as a quiz on something that I'm going over now. <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> for not, right? Okay. So, listen. Um, I, I I told you I told you all I I restruct all y'all all y'all I told all y'all. No, it's, you weren't here the first week. How do you think that? Yeah, well, I watched it. All you all, okay? That's, that's, what we, that's what we agreed from the south, okay? So I told all you all, or you all, okay, that you, no, that's how I restructured the grading, so you don't really have to do case studies. However, however, many of you aren't doing them. I, I'm not upset. I, I don't, you I used to come, them. I used to come, I wanted people to learn. It's not that I don't care if you don't learn, but, what I find disconcerting is that some of you who do not have financial skills are not doing the case studies. And you should be doing that for your own benefit. Aaron, I didn't mean, I could just, I, I didn't want to fix your own hand. I wasn't calling you out. Oh, that was lipstick or chapstick? Looks like lipstick. Oh, okay. It's a lip stain. Okay. Yes, my mom. If you do the case study it, 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 and then they do well on it, does it, does it benefit you in any way? Of course, you get points. Now you don't get a lot of points, and maybe you know, maybe I should hold on. One per, but that's not the point. But that's not the point. The point is not the grade. The point is the learning experience. The points aren't okay? the point. Okay, and that's. And that's, and that's, no, that's the point. That, so, that it's not about look, the point. Look, I had, I had a, so, I, I want to jump on that one. You should all grade yourselves, and, it's not that I want to call it, I enjoyed the exchange, okay, but, so I had a student, you know, I have no problem with students saying, look, I thought I did better, can you take a look at it? I really don't mind, I really don't mind, and I did look at it again, but, I got, a, I got an interesting response, and that's what I would expect from young people. Okay? It was like, it was like, well, you know, it's, it's really hard being critical of yourself. What? 
Give what you gotta be. <laughs> and, and at the end of the day, if you don't have what's the word in Spanish, autocritica. Uh, um, if you if you can't reflect on the things that you didn't do well, how do you improve? And so I know it's painful, right? That's nice. So, and it's easy to say, oh, I kind of, I kind of had that answer, kind of, you know, whatever. Um, but but you, you, you got to try, you got to try, and you got to learn from where you fell down. And if you don't take the challenge, then you fall down on the learning objective of the program, right? And I'm kind of looking at some of the more creative minds that we have here. I, look, I was, I was, I'm driving this morning thinking, what am I going to say about this? So I started riding motorcycles when I was older. I don't ride anymore, okay? I don't ride. I started riding. In Spain, it was all off-road stuff. I, I don't want like it's not only midlife crisis things. And it was all, no, so the friends I, you know, the friends I visit every year all ride off-road. And so what was happening is I always felt like the motorcycle was controlling me. It wasn't like I controlled the bike. Now part of it was I was usually going out with bigger bikes, and I should have been. But so what was the end result? I mean. I eventually stopped riding. I don't ride at all anymore because I got tired of falling down. Okay? And the last time I fell down a ditch, and if I'd been the last one on the line, I'd still be in the ditch. <laughs> you know, I didn't get hurt, but I was like face down, like eight feet down with a 400 pound bike on top of me. You know? If somebody didn't come off the ditch and take the bike off me, I'd still be there. But, but it's like the bike controlled me. And if you don't know numbers, they control you. And you need to control numbers. You can own numbers. You can make them dance the way you want to. Okay? And it's an art. And it will help you with your lenders. It will help you with your bosses. It will help you with your spouses. Okay? I, you know, I see it at home. I see it with the bickering between my mom and my dad. You know? It, if, if, you can, if you know how to play with numbers, you can own the universe. But if you're afraid of them, they will own you. And you'll keep getting thrown off the bike and follow the ditch and always have the 400 pound weight on top of you. Okay? So, I encourage you to give them a go so that you grow. At the end of the day, it's worth so little that even if you do badly, it's not going to hurt you. It'll always help because it's all additive. It, so, even if you get a 50, that's half a point. But, but it's not the half a point, it's what you learned, and it's what you thought, okay? Other things. I said this last week, and I was really disappointed. I don't get, all the questions had follow-on questions. And the follow-on questions are the tough ones. Okay, I'm going to read some of the answers I got, because I thought they were fun, okay? I do this every time, but... But what's important is it's, it's to follow on to the question. Someone asks you the why, right? So, uh, what's leasing spread? Well, these are PDFs. They're searchable. I was going to try to block the searchability, so you actually had to read the thing. Oh, no, 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 don't do that. Okay. Oh, it, it was cut and paste. Leasing spread was 11 point, you know, what are $11 and four, what is $7 and 42 cents, 11.4. I mean, everybody had to cut and paste the answer. And then the question was, talk to me about their trends in this, and talk to me about their prospects going forward based on what you see. And get answers. And so the question is, is, what is leasing spread and what's it telling me? And did anybody go back to the previous years and see what the trends were in leasing spreads? And did somebody contrast what those leasing spreads were in comparison to all the stuff we read about retailing? And can we draw some conclusions about this? So it's the follow-on question. Uh, talk to me about market, geographic, and tenant concentrations. And when we go through this stuff, when we look at building, when you buy a building or an asset, those are critical things to take a look at, right? So I mean, one of the answers I got was great. It was great. Sounds sarcastic. No, I loved it. Oh. KRC has decent diversification. That was the answer. It was supposed to indecent. 
I mean, no, but I mean, what, what does decent, decent diversification mean? I mean, I asked three specific questions. Talk to me about market diversification. How are they concentrated? How is the portfolio concentrated? And what are the implications of that? What is their tenant mix like? And what are the implications of that? Okay? Anyway, uh, naming files, guys, naming files, naming files. Uh, uh, I, I still, so I, I, a lot of you sent me spread, Excel spreadsheets. I talked the other day, and I'm, I'm going to do it next week. I, I don't have time to do it today. I'm going to go through some Excel basics, but um, I talked about something called hard coding the other day, and I kind of showed you the other day. It was like, so if you're going to do a formula, right, put the variables, you know, or whatever, you know, put the variable, I guess it goes the other way. Put the variables, you know, put a variable here, 2%, right? And in your calculation, point to that. Don't embed 1 times 0.02 here. Or the worst one, hard code numbers. Just put a number, 1.02. So you can send me an Excel spreadsheet, but the question is going to be, how do I review a number that's hard coded? And forget me. So this is a proxy. The class is a proxy for real life, right? You're going to send a projection to a joint venture partner. What do you want to do with it, Brandon? What's, why does he, when you, you want money, you want $50 million to do this development. Say, so what's the guy going to say? Send me a spreadsheet, send me a performer. What do you think he's asking you for that? He wants to see the numbers. And what else is he going to do with it? <clears throat> he's going to stress it. Yeah. He wants to understand your assumptions, and he wants to stress those assumptions, right? So. I can tell you, if you set an institutional investor a hard-coded spreadsheet, I don't think very highly of them. I'm not trying to pick on you. I mean, I'm just, you know, I just looked at you, so. I don't even think you did the assignment, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> In fact, I know you did, but that's neither here nor there. I mean, I did. But, but the point is, is, is don't hard-code. I mean, use Excel for what it is. Do the calculations in Excel. Don't just... You know, I, I had some people that still were doing tables in Word. And if you want to embed an Excel spreadsheet in Word, you can do that. I can show you how to do that. In fact, I'll show you how to do that next week because it's a great tool that you don't have. And then you can make changes in your Excel spreadsheet, and it'll flow right up to your Word document. Or I got a better one than that. You can change your variables, and they'll flow through the spreadsheet and go to Word. Yes, Anthony? Can you do the same thing with PowerPoint? Um, you can embed Excel spreadsheets and PowerPoint as well. And they don't do the same. Yeah, absolutely. As long as they're linked and the links don't break, absolutely. When you make the change in the underlying file, it'll flow up. Can you show us that as well? I'll show you that as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's on YouTube. It's, yeah, but no, I'll show you. I want to show you. Uh, uh, answer, ask questions. I only had a couple people ask me questions, and a lot of people run out of time. You know, I, I was I was at the hospital with my dad on Thursday, and that's in fact where I graded these things. Uh, and it was like, you know, I had like three or four, and then I had like eight came between like 2.50 and 3 o'clock. You know, like, <laughs> so I'm saying, okay, I know most of you work. If you're sending me something at three, I wonder how much effort went into that. And what would happen if your boss walked in, and so you're not either, you're neither doing your job right, no, you're doing your, 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 your assignment right. But anyway, that's just... Uh, so so I, I always cut. I didn't, I've got some classic ones from this that I'd accumulate over time. But I, just some, I, I cut one thing out from everybody, okay? So maybe they're not that funny. I don't know. NOI has gone up. I believe they will be able to pay their fixed charge obligations because the ratio is lower. Well, if NOI went up, the ratio should be higher, not lower. Uh, I like this one. KRC has a successful track record of sustainability. An accountant, man. I mean, that's like for Dr. Wurzer or somebody. I mean, I don't know. Sustainability. This is a financial class. Sorry, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm going to kill somebody. I'm going to kill somebody. Per Investopedia. Sorry. Sorry. What did I say sorry. Last I'm sorry. What did I say last week? Yeah. What? I'm kidding. What did I say last week? It wasn't him. I know who it was. <laughs> <laughs> Same guy called that last week. No, anyway, uh, 
the tenant mix of KRC is largely made up of stable Fortune 100 and Fortune 500 companies such as LinkedIn and DirecTV. Is LinkedIn a company, publicly traded company? It's a subsidiary of Microsoft and it doesn't disclose separate company financials. Is DirecTV a freestanding? No, it's through AT&T. AT&T. AT&T AT &T has more debt than most governments in the world. Yeah. They're like $400 billion in debt. So, listen, and we all learned, because I, I was stupid too. I, so I'll, I'll tell you that story. <laughs> No, I'm not saying it's a stupid, but but there's a perception that name there's a perception that name recognition has financial viability or stability, which are the words that are here. It's stable. But does Fortune magazine even exist anymore? I don't even know. I, so I, but anyway, so along along those, I wanted to tell my story in a second, but uh, reliable and developing companies like LinkedIn, Dropbox, Riot Games, and other promising organizations, which means the tenants are properly and widely diversified. Um, this one has many big name retailers such as Gap and Macy's. So um, I'm not sure that Gap is, is a great, you know. I, 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 I don't know that they are anymore. I think they may be controlled. I think Gap is publicly traded now, I yeah. think. Pretty sure but it's controlled by a company I like out of San Francisco or yes. something like that. Yeah, uh, they just split the companies, didn't they? There used to be like Old Navy, and then there was uh, Gap and everything. They were all one company. They've done some sort they of split, split of some brand yeah. or something. So now um, Old Navy is on its own. Okay. But but the the point that where I'm going with this is so we we had a we did a joint venture with Prudential and we had some excess land. And our development people really want to develop. I mean, they kept pushing all these deals. None of them made any sense to me, to be honest with you. But the development guys just wanted fees. You know, at the end of the day, we were a company, and everybody was in their silo. And every company, every subsidiary made fees, and every executive of every subsidiary had bonuses tied to the revenues. So what did the construction people want to do? Build a bunch of junk. What did development people want to do? Earn a bunch of fees so they could get their... And I was running this joint venture, so I, I was outside the corporate bubble, but I was part of, and they, they kept bringing all these harebrained suggestions. So Delta Airlines at the time had an RFP in the market, and they wanted to build a new call center. And, and we seemed to fit, they had certain demographic information that they gave us about their employee base that seemed to indicate that we were ideally located for that. So that was a plus that we had. The use didn't really make sense. It was an, it's an industrial area. It was an industrial project. This was an office use. We were going to do something there. Maybe some retail would have worked or some expansion of the industrial would have made sense. The parking requirement didn't make sense. But, but the location for the tenant seemed to make sense. And so they, our development guys said, yeah, let's do it. So they, you know, they spent a lot of time and effort putting this um, RFP together, responding to the RFP. And uh, I sent it to, yes ma'am? <clears throat> How do you find the, because I used to put together a lot of private, public sector RFPs, where do you find those private sector RFPs? Well, so the, the way, so why did we have a brokerage operation? Because brokerage businesses make a lot of money? No, brokers can make a lot of money, but brokerage <laughs> firms don't make a lot of money. But why do you have a, a property management division? Do property management businesses make a lot of money? No. Why do we have those two? because it gave us reach to the market. So how did that come to us? Because we had a broker base that was out there all the time and they had relationships. And so they knew Delta or they knew the broker that was out with Delta and they say, hey, we got a development group, we've got land, we can respond to that. So that's why you need to be tied to a marketing organization or why it's helpful to have a marketing organization within a development business. They give you access to the market, okay? Um, and so I, you know, they put all this, you know, all this, you know, effort into it, and, and they were like, "We're going to send it." And I said, "You can't send it. We got to talk to our partners about this." You know, I mean, I'm not sure if the partners are on board. So I sent it away. And this guy in New York calls me back. He says, "Why are we doing this shit?" And I'm like, "You know, you know, I got all this pressure. These guys want to do it." And so he said to me two things. 
and I'll never forget. He first he said, why, why would I want to own an office building that, so we had to put all kinds of like electronics and redundancy of power and air conditioning. He goes, why do I want to own a suburban office building at $600 square foot price? This is 15 years ago, 16 years ago. Why do I want to own a $600 square foot office building? And I said, what do you mean? He said, how do I sell that? I mean, the building, we talked the other day, what's a suburban office building sell for in Florida? $180 a square foot. What's the first question you ask yourself when you buy something? Who am I going to sell it to? How do I sell it? Where am I going to sell it, right? So this guy's saying, why don't I put $600 a square foot into a suburban office building? It, it doesn't make any sense. As an institutional buyer, it doesn't make any sense. But then he asked me the most important question, and he says, what's credit of Delta look like? I said, I don't know, it's Delta. Must be good. <laughs> so we take a look at it. Take a look at it. It wasn't that good. And Delta wound up going bankrupt like three or four years later. But it sounded good. Yeah, it's the most stable of all the airlines. It's great service. Household name, 100-year-old company. Doesn't mean anything. None of that stuff means anything. Okay, so the fact that things are stable or name you know, recognition, Uber has a lot of name recognition. How much did they lose last quarter? A, a billion dollars. Tesla's really, Tesla's a great product. Tesla's a great product. I'm not sure it's a great business. You know, so anyway. Uh, UDR must maintain at least a ratio of 1.5. I believe this is a low hurdle. I didn't ask you it was a low hurdle. <laughs> I didn't even ask you what the ratio was. Uh, I think they will do well in 2018 as long as their market rates go up. I mean, you know, if it rains, I'm going to get wet. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this means that the company is good to invest in and can pay off their payments. I didn't ask you if they were good to invest in. I mean, those weren't the questions, right? Uh, the total operating expense incurred by UDR was $811 million. I didn't ask for that. I asked for a percentage, and I got several people answered that. They told me what operating expenses were. They didn't ask me for the percentage. Now, curiously on that one, and I'm going to jump to the answer on that, uh, the real bit that I wanted to address there was, how does it compare to their peers? You know, did anybody go to Boma and take a look at what operating metrics should be for multifamily? Did anybody go to other REITs and compare? I think one or two other people, one or two other people went to REITs, but for the most part it was like, yeah, it's in line. Well, how do you know it's in line? Do you really know? You know, what should operating expenses be in a multifamily set? We have any multifamily people here? No? No? Question number one, easy. I'm not going to go over that one, okay? Please identify three sections. That's just going to the table of index, you know. There's, there's FFO data, there's per share data, there's, there's debt data, there's development data, there's financial statements, um, there's all kinds of stuff. Please identify the principal asset class. Please identify the principal asset class. Asset class, as of other invested in real estate. What's the asset class? <laughs> No. So KR, KRC is an, is, is an office REIT, okay? Office is the asset class they're in. I think they've got one retail development or something. Some people wrote multi. Yeah, it's technically, you're right. But they're an office REIT. They're office class. Simon is in what, what, what asset class? Retail. Shopping retail. Retail. So I mean, retail is a bunch of, and they do have different subclasses. They're in retail. So, okay, so what happens if you are only doing mixed use, would you be commercial asset? Um, or do they have an asset class for that yet? So, <coughs> no, so, so mixed use by definition is multiple asset classes under one umbrella. Okay. So that, you know, um, um, for the most part, what I, would, what I would tell you is happening, and, and again, let's talk about the public REIT space for a second. What's probably happening more than anything else is retail centers or retail REITs are becoming more multi-use REITs because they're starting. They they're ha they've got vacancy, they've got parking. They're not they're not using, right? And so they're starting to in certain places put multifamily, um, 
you don't really see office, but you're seeing multifamily probably more than anything else. It's kind of, you know, residential nights of the services that are provided. Okay? Um, and UDR is multifamily. Mm -hmm. Apartments, multifamily. Okay? It's a. Uh, Next one's easy. Fully diluted net income per share. I think everybody got that right, that answer. Uh, as of the most recent quarter end date, what was the 12-month trailing uh, price earnings ratio? What is trailing versus forward? His historical. So when we talk about PE, we're going to take a look at what? X ex post, right? <clears throat> Past, historical, last 12 months, or we can look at forward, okay? And that's ex ante, right? That's before, and that's a projection, okay? We know this number, we don't know this number. Some people analyze companies and age. all the guys, on, everybody on television is always trying to tell you why stocks, a particular stock is not overvalued, and they're always saying, oh, when you look at forward, when you look at 2023 earnings, or when you look at you know forward earnings, the PE is only so much. But but there's a known number. That's a forecast. May not be that good. Okay, so personally, I like to take a look at this because this is telling me what the most recent history of the company. I'm not saying you did not you know you neglect that, but this is a hard number that you know you can come to. Um, um, price earnings per share, and I. A lot of you guys, I couldn't really look at where the numbers were coming from, okay? But uh, price earnings is price per share, right? Divided by earnings per share, okay? You had earnings per share in the reports that were given out. Where would you get the market price per share? Stock market. Well, where in the stock market? The easiest place to go is go to Yahoo Finance and get a historical quote as of the date of the close. Now, some of these may, I don't remember now where I got the, the answer from. Some of these may have had their stock quote at the end of the day, yeah. okay? But you could have always verified that by going to a public source. And I say, you, Yahoo Finance is great for that. I don't use Google for that. I use Yahoo Finance. It's been a historically a, a good site. Okay, but that's market price per share divided by earnings per share. And it's a number. A lot of you people put percentages. Some of you put dollar signs. It's a number. It's an absolute number. So it's 17 times. Okay? The dollar sign and the dollar sign cancel each other out. It's a number. It's not a percentage. Uh, I asked the question is, what, what's the industry average? Where would you get an industry average of, of price earnings? Increase. <coughs> <Re-read. coughs> re 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 thing that you just told us about? Now read. May read? Not that one. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> May read? May read that one. Nary, yeah. Does May read put what the average multiples are? I, I found some. some you found it in Investopedia. No, I didn't use Investopedia. You, no, somebody else found it in Investopedia. It was, so, I mean, I actually went, I was stupid. I went to my Schwab account, right? And I calculated the price earnings for all the different companies, right? And then I weight, value weighted it, and I came up with a number. There are services out there that have it. But the question is, the question is the following. If the market multiple is 30, and, it, and your particular multiple for a particular company you're looking at is, bless you, 25 or 35, forget the absolute numbers. And I didn't get a lot of people answering one way or another on this. Let's take a look. The market multiple is 30. And I'm trading at 25. What's the implication of that? You're below the market. Yeah. Okay. The market is valuing me at a lower at a lower level at a lower relative level than all of my peers. So there's a lot of potential implications of that. Yeah. The first one is the market may not understand my company, but can also say, 
I don't have the same growth prospects, I don't have the same quality of management, I don't have the same ability to deliver, okay? If, if I'm trading at a higher than market multiple, what is what is that? What are the implications of that? Market procedure. Maybe best. maybe my they, I think they got great management. I've yeah. got an incredible ability to deliver. Growth. I may have more growth than everybody else. Okay. Now, the other sort of implication of all of this is is, and I don't want to get into valuations, but it might mean. This one's overvalued, and when it reverts back to its mean, it's going to drop in value, and this one is going to come back up. Because at the end of the day, when you're dealing with companies at that scale, one's got to believe most managements are going to deliver. And most managements that are in a particular industry are going to deliver something similar to what everybody else is. That's why you always benchmark to your peers. If you're habitually below because you're underperforming management, what do you think happens to you? What happens if you're a manager of a, of a soccer team? And I mean, I was shocked this week. I, I don't really follow club soccer, but Barcelona is like one of the top clubs in the, in the world. They won the league again this year. Guy's been a, a manager two years. They want to fire the guy because he didn't win the Copa del Rey or something, and they got knocked out in the semifinals on the... You lose your job. You got to be like on top of your game. If you're a CEO, so we can get into, and I don't want to defend executive pay, but you know we talk about the disparity that exists between executive pay and worker pay, workforce pay. All those guys are overpaid, but guess what happens when they don't deliver? Golden parachute. Well, yeah. <laughs> they don't have a job, or not? You lose your job. Um, fully diluted FFO. That was another sort of cut face one. That wasn't an issue. Uh, I asked for total debt to total capitalization ratio. Now, you could have just used what the company did, but if you would have calculated, you would have come up with different numbers. And, and, and some of you did and some of you didn't. <coughs> Not everything, you know, management sometimes, you, you got to do your own calculations. The, the information's there. What's, what is total debt to total market capitalization? Give me the give me the, the mathematical formula. For, I mean, Kyle, it's like, what's the color of George Washington's white horse? White. What's total debt to total market capitalization? Assets. Give me. Okay, I'll do it for you. Total, total debt on top, right? Total debt. Let's learn how to do math, English to math. Total debt over. Total debt plus shareholders equity. He said market cap? Total debt to total market capitalization. Uh, shares outstanding, price per share. I mean, the, the, it was, it, they showed how they did it. So, total debt, and in most of these companies, the total debt is going to be the face value of the debt, okay? Plus. Equity? Yep. Market cap. Yeah. Now, the other day we were talking about leverage ratios. And we're talking, when we talk about leverage ratios, we talked about what? We talked about skin in the game. We talked about, when we talk about leverage, it's about whose money is at risk. So when we said leverage, we said, if I've got 100 in assets, how much is the lender at risk for, and how much is the owner at risk for? And that's what this debt to equity ratio. And so, in, in our traditional leverage measures, we would say 50, so we would say debt to equity. For some reason, for some reason, REITs, because they want to have a lower number, they say, no, we're not going to use equity, we're going to look at market cap. Now, what's market cap? Ryan, now you can answer your question. Uh, price, uh, share price times. Number of shares outstanding, yeah. right? Times the market price per share. So, so what these guys are saying is, is they're substituting equity 
for what the market perceives the value of the equity to be. So they're saying, look, it's not historical equity, it's market value. What it does is it, I mean, I think it distorts, it's going to make it look like they've got less debt. It's going to distort. So, I mean, all these companies had, you know, 30% and below. Right? And what did we say typically debt was levered or real estate was levered in this country? What did we talk about? 65. Se 70. But, but when you look at core assets, I didn't get into all the attributes of core assets, but one of the attributes of core assets is that you tend to use less leverage. Okay? So I think probably using a 50, 60% number is probably more realistic in a context of, of a REIT, right? And all these guys are coming out with 30% ratios. What are you trying to do? I mean, why are they doing this? He's trying to make, you know, everybody's selling you something all the time. So all of a sudden, if you don't really go beyond the veneer, you just go, oh, wow, these guys only have 30% leverage. Wow, there's no risk there. There's a lot of equity standing behind. Jeez, you know, if I'm a lender, wow, I, I'm, I'm going to pile money into this, you know, into this company because there's a bunch of shareholder equity supporting it. Well, not necessarily. It's market perception of equity, which may or not may not necessarily be correlated to historical equity. Okay. <coughs> Any thoughts on that? Any questions? No. Why wouldn't Why wouldn't the market Why wouldn't the, the price per outstanding share be the same as the, as the market value? Market value. Well, because accounting is done on a historical cost basis. Okay. Now. Um, so imagine you're U.S. Steel and you've got assets on your book that you bought in 1915. You know, there's not going to be a lot of correlation in some companies between what you historically paid for something and what it may be worth in the marketplace. Now, if you're a bank, if you're a bank, I would make an argument, a bank, almost all of its assets are monetary or should have some sort of ready monetizable value. Most financial institutions should have a market cap that approximates shareholder value. The reality is they don't. Uh, people tend to value publicly traded shares at a higher value than historical cost. And so you'll see, I mean, financial institutions have gone up, but you know, you'll see banks probably paying two to three dollars per book value to buy each other out today. From my perspective, from my perspective, when I look at value, one of the things I look for is some relationship between, and you know, when I look at deep value plays, I'm looking at companies that are trading below their shareholder value. Yes, Nathan, what was the question? Well, you, you just made a uh, kind of analogy of U.S. Steel uh, having assets that they purchased in 1915. They purchased Western Pennsylvania land uh, land in 1915. Uh, that would be the value of that would be would be significantly to, higher. Yeah. And so the asset on their book would be very low compared to what the market value is. So that's a case where you potentially can easily explain why market cap should be higher than book value. And then I gave you a bank in which the asset should pretty much be stated at market. So uh, correspondingly, there shouldn't really be any differentiation, but, but market cap is what the market perceives that value to be. And, and I can tell you, most companies today, you're gonna see most companies trade at a market cap higher than historical book value. And for most companies, that's probably right. How much more? Okay? I mean, because none of the companies really are trading or recorded at liquidation value. So you don't really know what, if we sold all the assets, what would I get per share? Um, I didn't ask the question, most of the question was, what's the percentage of fixed rate debt? And is it good or bad? So most of them had fixed rate debt. Is that good or bad? Most of these REITs have fixed rate debt. Is that good or bad? I think it's good. I think it's good. You think it's good because? Because it... I mean, interest rates just went down 30 basis points in a week. Go up. If it rains, we can get wet. Well, 
if if they focus their operations on beating that cost of debt, they don't have to worry about as that high number. So you're saying like that, that that is a known component. Mm -hmm. It's a known component, right. and it's something that I can manage to. Okay, yeah. I like that. I, I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Where are interest rates in comparison to historical trends? Low. Low. <coughs> Way low at historic lows. Could they go lower? Potentially. Maybe. How much lower could interest rates go? Not very much. Not that much. <laughs> How much higher could they go? Wow. What's the upside? A lot, right? Okay, now, here's a, a, here's a counting, here's a counting advice. Watch it, okay? Current assets, okay? You should match with current liabilities from a maturity perspective, okay? And typically, current assets are going to be financed right. with variable rate debt. Why? These are monetizable. You can change price. All of a sudden, you've got rising prices. You've got inflation. Interest rates go up. That's okay. I can mark my inventories up. Okay. Long-term assets, long-term debt, right? Match maturities, and you do so with fixed rates to take away the uncertainty. Okay. Now, that's a rule of thumb. You don't have to live by it, but that's a very conservative, traditional accounting perspective in the world. Okay. There's also I don't want to get into it. There's a sort of historical financial intermediaries who finances what and under what basis they finance it. You know, and why they would, you know, financial intermediary would only finance that with variable rate debt. And it has to do with where they're matching their funds from. But that's that's for another, that's for a different class. Okay? Um, UDR, okay, so I asked this question and I really only got one or two people at time. There are two questions that piggyback on each other. One was UDR, um, their, their uh, um, uh, fixed charge coverage ratio, okay? And so I, I talked the other day about you, you can define coverage in a lot of different ways, but what you're basically trying to do is measure available cash flow with that service or some sort of so. Sometimes you might use NOI, you might use net income, um, um, you might just use interest, or you might use your, your whole debt service component, okay? But what you're trying to see is, is, are you generating enough income to service your debt? Do you have enough cash flow to service your debt, okay? So UDR has 4.8 times fixed charge coverage. What does that tell you? I think most of you got that right. It, you, you, you're amply covered. You're generating sufficient cash flow to service your debt, historically. And if you're in a, in, in a multifamily environment, you've got historical occupancies in the 90 some odd percent. You, your leases are no more than a year, but they're not all gonna expire in one day, right? And, and we saw that, we saw from the last answer, it looks like they've got some pricing power so logic's going to tell me that cash flow is going to recur. Operating expenses are also pretty predictable, right? So I've got a pretty good or certain factor as a creditor that I shouldn't have any credit issues with this particular company. They can service their debt. Okay. Now we go to Kilroy. What's the... What's the debt service coverage ratio there, the fixed charge ratio there? 7.2? Yeah, some of, some of you got it, got it wrong. I, I mean, I, I had 7.2. Some people have 4.2. So I don't know why, but it's 7.2. I don't know where the 4.2 was coming from, but go to page 26. Whatever, it doesn't matter. That's not the point. There was a, the, the real point in this particular question was, take a look at maturity. Because when you look at the capacity the service debt, you can't just look at historical cash flow to service only the debt service. You got to take a look at maturities. And where do you get that? Typically, you get that in a footnote of financial statements, or in the case of REIT, you get that in their supplementals. So, talk to me about their maturities. Did anybody look at their maturities? Oh yeah. Yeah. So okay. they've got three hundred and forty million dollars due in the next four years. Mm -hmm. How much cash do they have available on the balance sheet? That's 
forty million dollars. How are they going to service that debt? You got to refinance somehow. Okay. So now the question becomes: Is what's the company's ability to refinance? And all I'm trying to show here, not so if you don't answer the question, you miss the point. Oh, they cover. They're fine. No. So today, what's the likelihood of a re being able to refinance your debt? Probably pretty good. What was it in 2008? Mm -hmm. What was Lenard's ability to refinance debt in 2000? I wasn't with them in 2000. Sorry? I wasn't with them in 2000. Oh, you're like a millennial, right? Where that means you were born after 2000. Is that what that means? <laughs> no. So what was their ability? Not, not that good. Now, now I'm going to jump to someone and say later on, lenders, lenders don't want to... Lenders don't want to hold your asset, so they're going to work with you somehow, okay? But, but you don't want to be in a situation where you're in default and you can't refinance, or you have maturity and you can't refinance it. Yes, Ryan? So we got this uh, 300 million coming due next year now. Is it a potential for them to fix it in at a lower number than that 6.6? Well, so I mean, so, it could be so, a good thing. So, I mean, I, and I think you had an answer on that. Yeah, so, so, I saw both sides. So, one of, so, so look, I'm going to look at it in a different way in a few weeks when we take a look, look at lease maturities, okay? But when you look at debt maturities, there, there are opportunities and there are risks, right? So a potential opportunity is, a, is an ability to extend for a significant period of time that maturity, right? So I don't have to worry about it. Now, I, I've taken, I, I'm not here, right? I don't have water up to here. Another potential opportunity is to reset that or remark that at a lower rate. Or even another one is, is, is to address different conditions. Maybe it can be unsecured. Maybe I've got secured debt that I can replace with an unsecured note. Okay? Maybe I can get rid of guarantees. Maybe I can adjust certain covenants. Okay? And covenants, covenants are, in a lot of cases, ratios. Okay, we didn't talk about that one the other day. Covenants are conditions of a, of a loan agreement, which are either going to allow you or prohibit you or force you as a, as a borrower to do things or to refrain from doing things. So some of them might be like, you got to keep a working capital ratio of this or you got to keep only so much working capital. But it could also be things like, you're going to have a personal guarantee on this, or if your net worth falls below a certain amount, you're going to put a personal guarantee. It might say you need to have your net worth here. It might say that you're going to have covered ratios over X amount. It might prohibit you from paying dividends. It might prohibit you from making capital expansions or acquisitions. They may prohibit you from selling certain things. Okay, so. So they are, they are sort of affirmative and negative conditions associated with a contract, okay? So maybe part of refinancing an opportunity is to get more favorable conditions from your lender. Okay, what are the potential downfalls? The, the, the total opposite. People are gonna squeeze you more. You might have to give up more collateral. You might have worse conditions, okay? You might have shorter terms, okay? so. That's what happens. Same thing with lease, lease roll. I got a, all the leases expire next year. Holy moly, why would I want to buy that? What if I can't renew them? Then look at the other side of it. What if I renew them all and I got a 30% bump to market? That's a great opportunity, right? So uh, one of the differences between core and value type assets are is, is lease maturity and how and how that, you know, is structured, right? So a value plus asset may have a tremendous amount of near-term expirations with uncertainty, okay? Uh, we developed the building in Delray many years ago. We sold it, uh, single tenant. We had IBM in there, we sold it, made a bunch of money. Eight years later, we do a 1031, and we want, we want the building again. Guess what? It's eight years later. IBM's lease expires in two years, and the building was vacant. They were paying the rent, but it was vacant. And so, guys, no, we can lease this thing. Don't worry, buy it. 
I bought it off market. Found a buy, I mean, found the owner. I'm the fees the loan. What happened two years later? I was gone, but what happened two years later? IVM blew out. What happened four years later? The building was still building, it was still empty. Oh, San Miguel was terrible, that guy. He was horrible, that guy. But so you know the risk is there. Now let's go to question number 10. Market, tenant, and industry diversification of Kilroy. What is market diversification? Are they diversified? No? Yes. Okay. What was the question? Sorry. Oh. What day is it? No, I'm saying. Where'd you cut your hair? No. Market. What does market diversification mean? Properties in and multiple markets. Correct. So give me, are they diversified? No. Not really. No. Does anybody think they are? Some, some people told me they were. Well, which company? Kilroy. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Somebody, some people told me they were diversified. Somebody said, oh, they got stuff in San Francisco and in LA. What? <laughs> Out west. Temple. Okay, it's all in the same fault yeah. line. It's all in the same country. Um, and I, I don't know the answer to that, but but I, I would say my perspective would be that Kilroy, as most major office suites, are pretty concentrated in their holdings. Okay? Yes, they do have some San Diego. Yes, they do have some Seattle. I think they've got a building maybe on the East Coast. But for the most part, they are heavily concentrated, really in the Bay Area, okay? And so, so out of the box, I would say, from a market diversification perspective, they are not highly diversified. Now, is that good or bad? It's bad. What happens if there's an earthquake in San Francisco, right? It will be. Not good, right? Not, not good, okay. Um, yeah. But what are the good sides of not being diversified? It was a question we had the other day that people didn't answer. We talked about if you're a merchant builder, what's the advantages of being sort of decentralized and spread out versus being very concentrated? You get to know the market a whole lot more. You, you control the market, you've got market knowledge, you've got, you've got efficiency in management, right? Um, and so how would, how would an investor address this? 